terms of land and population, the Reach is the largest of the six kingdoms south of the Neck. The North, whilst vast in size, is thinly populated. The kingdom is commonly referred to as the Reach, but this name is somewhat of a misnomer. The domains of House Tyrell, the Lords of Highgarden, now largely correspond with those of the Old Kingdom of the Reach, as it existed for thousands of years before the conquest of Aegon Targaryen. But that ancient, rich and fertile kingdom was in fact once comprised of four smaller petty kingdoms. Endless Sunset Sea is found to the west, whilst the rich and prosperous hills of the Westerlands are to the northwest, with the Blackwater Rush of the Riverlands situated to the north. The Reach borders the Crownlands to the northeast, whilst to the east and southeast are the Stormlands and the Dornish Marches. South of the Reach are the Red Mountains of Dawn and the Summer Sea. The Rose Road links Old Town with King's Landing by way of High Garden, while the Ocean Road links High Garden with Lannisport and Casterly Rock. Old Town, the domain of House Hightower, is bounded by the Red Mountains of Dawn to the east and the headwaters of the Honeywine in the north. Back before Dawn joined the Seven Kingdoms. Incursions and raids across the mountains were common, however, not near as frequent as in the Dornish marches of the Stormlands. Just southeast of Old Town, we have the Arbor, the golden island beyond the Red Wine Strait. Famed even in Essos for its wine and sunshine, ships from all over the known world travel to the Arbor to simply export wine to the rich magisters and slavers as far east as east goes. The red wine ships often make up a good part of the royal fleet as well. Among the products that the Reach is famous for producing are melons, fire plums, peaches, apples and grapes. But Old Town specifically is famous for its wood harps, which are highly sought after by singers and mummers all around the world. Before Aegon's conquest, the golden coins of the Reach were known as hands. So many were made, they still exist in some number by the time of Robert Baratheon's reign, with each hand coin roughly half the value of a golden dragon. The Reach as a kingdom is a vast expanse of lush green fields and farms, deep blue lakes and rivers, hills and woods and fragrant meadows. Mills frequent the landscape, and there are even a few small mines. All this mixed with small villages, thriving market towns and ancient castles stretching from the Shield Islands in the Sunset Sea up the mouth of the Manda past High Garden to Red Lake, Gong Grove and Bitterbridge, as far as Tumbleton and the Manda's headwater. This green and fertile kingdom was the realm ruled by the legendary house gardener of old, kings of the Reach for hundreds of years, but in more recent history, after the conquest of Aegon the Conqueror and the extinction of house gardener, the rule of the Reach is now in the hands of the descendants of the Gardener's Stewards, the Tyrells of High Garden. The Reach is also known for being the home of chivalry. It is said it was in the green fields of the Reach that chivalry was born. History says that the gallant knights and fair maidens of the Reach are celebrated throughout the Seven Kingdoms by the singers whose own tradition first took root here as well. Once and always a great realm and an important part of Westeros, the Reach is many things to its inhabitants. The most populous, fertile and powerful domain in the Seven Kingdoms, its wealth is second only to the gold-rich Westerlands, and thus House Lannister of Casterly Rock. The rivalry between the kingdoms ran so deep, countless wars, large and small, were fought between the Kings of the Reach and the Kings of the Rock, between House Gardner and Lannister. With Old Town, the Reach is a seat of learning, a centre of music, culture and all the arts. Bright and dark, the breadbasket of Westeros, a nexus of trade, a home to great seafarers, wise and noble kings, dreaded sorcerers, and the most beautiful women in all of Westeros. During the reign of Robert Baratheon, the military strength of the Reach was said to be 50,000 swords. However, some sources have stated the House Tyrell are able to field at least 70,000 soldiers, with the caveat that not all of them are fighting men, so the true number likely lies somewhere in the middle. Their bannermen's strength range in number as well. House Florent can feel 2,000 swords at best, while House Hightower, at least during the Dance of the Dragons between 129 and 131 AC, were able to field much more than 9,000 men, though due to the sheer amount of losses, it's hard to estimate. They can mostly likely field a similar number during the reign of Robert Baratheon, having kept out of many wars and conflicts since the Dance of the Dragons. The naval strength of the Reach is made up mostly of the Red Wine Fleet of the Arbor, which contains at least 200 warships. Historically, under House Targaryen, the Red Wine Fleet would function as part of the Royal Fleet, alongside House Valarian. The fleet of the Reach can also be supplemented further by the modest fleet of the Shield Isles, whom over the centuries have used their small but powerful fleet to ward off the raiders of the Iron Islands. On a hill overlooking the Manda rises High Garden, rightly held as the most beautiful castle in the realm. The Manda itself, which flows beneath its walls, 
is the longest and broadest river in the Seven Kingdoms. The great city of Old Town is the equal of King's Landing in size and is superior in all other respects, being vastly older and more beautiful with its cobbled streets, ornate guild halls, stone houses and three great monuments, the Starry Sept of the Faith, the Citadel of the Maesters and the mighty High Tower with its great beacon, the tallest tower in all of the known world and whose construction is clouded in mystery. The history of the Reach in the days of the First Men is not unlike that of the other realms of Westeros. The bounty of these green and fertile lands did not make men more peaceful nor less grasping if anything the exact opposite occurred. Here too, the first men strove against the children of the forest, rooting them out from their sacred groves and hollow hills, hewing down their weirwood with great bronze axes. Here too, kingdoms rose and kingdoms fell and were forgotten to time, as petty kings and proud lords contended with one another for land and glory, whilst towns burned and women wailed, and sword rang against sword, century after century. And yet there was a difference, in degree, if not in kind, for almost all of the noble houses of the Reach share a common ancestry, deriving as they did from Garth Greenhand and his many children. It was that kinship many scholars have suggested that gave House Gardener the primacy in the centuries that followed. No petty king could ever hope to rival the power of Highgarden, where Garth the Gardener's descendants sat upon a living throne, the oaken seat, that grew from the oak that Garth Greenhand himself planted, and wore a crown of vines and flowers when at peace, and crowns of bronze thorns, and later iron when they rode to war. Others might style themselves kings, but the Gardeners were the unquestioned high kings, and lesser monarchs did them honour, if not obedience. In those centuries, the Reach produced many fearless warriors, from that day to this. The singers have celebrated the deeds of knights like Serwin of the Mirror Shield, Davos the Dragonslayer, Roland of the Horn, and the Knight Without Armour, and the legendary kings who led them into battle. Among them, Garth V, the Hammer of the Dornish, Gwain I, the Galliant, Giles I, the Woe, Garth II, the Grim, Garth VI, the Morning Star, and Gordon I, the Grey Eyes. Many of these monarchs shared a common foe, for during these dark and bloody centuries, seaborne reavers from the Iron Islands dominated all of the western shore. From Bear Island in the north to the Arbor in the south, with their swift longships, the Ironborn were able to strike and depart before any response could come. The raiders often came ashore at unexpected places, taking the enemies unaware. Though the Ironmen seldom ventured far inland, they controlled the Sunset Sea and extended cruel tribute from all of the fisherfolk along the coast. Having established themselves upon the Shield Islands by killing all the men they found there and claiming the women as their own, the Ironborn even raided up the Manda with impunity. King Quarred, the most fearsome of the Ironborn overlords, boasted that his writ ran wherever men can smell salt water or hear the crash of waves. He was known as Quarred the Cruel in the Reach, and the kings who succeeded him went by such by names as Hogan the Terrible, Joron the Maiden's Bane. It was against these men and their followers the kings of House Gardener contended for three centuries, sometimes in alliance with the kings of the Rock and the lords of Old Town, and sometimes even alone. No fewer than six Gardener kings died in battle, amongst them Garth the Grim and Garth the Morning Star, while Giles II was taken captive captive, tortured, and cut into small pieces to bait his captors' hooks. Yet the victory was long last theirs, and each of them pushed their domains of House Gardener and brought more lands and lords beneath the rule of High Garden. That being said, many scholars still believe that the greatest of the Gardener kings were the peacemakers, not the fighters. Fewer songs are sung of them, it is true, but in the annals of history, the names of Garth III, the Great, Garden II, the Bridegroom, Gwain the Third, the Fat, and John the Second, the Tall, are writ large, and Garth the Great extended the borders of his realm northward, winning Old Oak, Red Lake, and Golden Grove, with packs of friendship and mutual defence. Garland accomplished the same in the south, bringing Old Town into his kingdom by wedding his daughter to Lyman, the sea lion of House Hightower, whilst putting his own wife aside to marry Lyman's daughter. Gwain the Fat persuaded Lord Peak and Lord Manderley to accept his judgment on their quarrel, came to the borders and lands. They pledged their fealty without fighting a single battle. John the Tall sailed his barge up the Manda to the very headwater, planting a banner of the green hand wherever he went receiving homage from lords and petty kings, whose lands lined the mighty river's banks. Greatest of all the Gardener kings was Garth the Seventh, the Golden Hand, a giant in both war and peace. As a boy, 
he turned back the Dornish when King Ferris Fowler led 10,000 men through the Prince's Pass. Intent on conquest, soon after he turned his attention to the sea and drove the last of the Ironborn from their strongholds on the Shield Islands. Thereafter, he resettled the islands with his fiercest fighters, granting them special dispensation for the purpose of turning them into the first defence against the Ironborn should they return. This proved a great success, and to this day, the men of the Four Shields pride themselves on defending the mouth of the Manda and the heart of the Reach against any seaborne foes. In his last and greatest war, Garth VII faced an alliance between the Storm King and the King of the Rock, intent on carving up the Reach between them, but he defeated both of them. Then, with cunning words, sowed such discourse between them they turned on one another with a great slaughter at the battle of the three armies in the aftermath he married his daughter to their heirs and signed a pact with each fixing the borders between the three kingdoms yet that even paled before his greatest accomplishment three quarters of a century of peace garth goldenhand became king of the reach at the age of 12 and died upon the oaken seat when he was 93 still sound of wit if only frail in body during the 81 years of his reign the reach was at war for less than for 10 of them generations of boys were born and grew to manhood side children of their own and died without ever knowing what it was to grasp a spear and shield and march away to war and with this long peace came an unprecedented prosperity the golden reign as this time came to be known was when the reach truly flowered yet all golden ages end and so it was with the reach garth golden hand passed from this world and his great grandson followed him upon the oaken seat then gave way to his own sons and then came the andals the andals came late to the reach crossing the narrow sea in long ships they landed first upon the shores of the vale then later along the eastern coasts the fleets of old town and the arbor barred them from the red wine straits and the sunset sea for a long while however Unfortunately for the first men, reports of the bounty and wealth of the Reach and the power of Highgarden and its kings undoubtedly reached the ear of many an Andal warlord, but other lands and other kings lay between them. Thus, long before the Andals reached the Manda, the kings in Highgarden knew of their coming. They observed the fighting in the Vale, the Stormlands and the Riverlands from afar, taking note of all that happened. Wiser perhaps than their counterparts from the other regions, they did not make the error of allying with the Andals against local rivals. Gwain the Fourth, the God-fearing, sent his warriors searching out the children of the forest in the hopes that the green seers and their magic could halt the invaders. Merne the second, the mason, built a new curtain wall around Highgarden, commanded his bannermen to see to their own defences. Merne the third, the maddening, showered gold and honours on a woods witch who claimed that she could raise the army of the dead to throw the Andals back. Lord Redwine built more ships and Lord Hightower strengthened the walls of Old Town. Yet the great battle most of them had anticipated never came to pass. By the time the conquerors were done conquering the eastern shores, generations passed and the Andals had raised up two score petty kings of their own. Many of them at odds with one another and in Highgarden three sage kings followed one another upon the oaken seat. Garth the Ninth Gardener, his son Merle the First, the Meek, and his grandson Gwain the Fifth were very different men, but they shared a common policy towards the Andals, one based on accord and assimilation rather than armed resistance. Garth the Ninth brought Septons to his court and made them part of his councils, and built the first Sept at Highgarden, though he himself continued the worship in the castle's godwoods. His son Merl formally exposed the faith, however, and helped fund the construction of the Septs, Septries and mother houses all over the Reach. Gwain V was the first gardener born into the faith, and the first to be made a knight by the solemn rite and vigil. True knighthood only came to Westeros with the Andals. Both Merle and Gwain took Andal maidens as their wives, as a means of binding their brides' fathers to the realm, and all three kings took Andals into their service and household knights and retainers. Amongst those so honoured was Andal knights named Sir Alistair Tyrell, whose prowess at arms was such that he was made the king's champion and sworn shield under Gwain V. Sir Alice's descendants in time became the hereditary stewards of Highgarden under the gardeners. The three sage kings also found lands and lordships for more powerful Andal kings descending on the reach. In return for pledges of fealty, the gardeners sought after Andal craftsmen as well and encouraged their lord bannermen to do the same. Blacksmiths and stonemasons in particular were handsomely rewarded. The former taught the first men to arm and armour themselves in iron in place of bronze. The latter helped them strengthen the defences of their castles and holdfasts. And although some of those new-made lords forswore their vows in later years, most did not. 
Rather, they joined the liege lords to put down such rebels and defended the reach against those and all kings and war bands who came later. When a wolf descends upon your flock, all you gain by killing him is a short respite. If instead you feed the wolf and tame him and turn his pups into your guard dogs, they will protect the flock when the pack comes ravaging. King Gwain V said it differently, however. They gave us the seven gods. We gave them dirt and daughters, and, and our sons and grandsons shall be as brothers. Many noble houses of the Reach traced their ancestry back to the Andal adventurers given land and wives by Garth the Knight, Mel I and Gwain V. Amongst them, the Ormonds, the Parons, the Gracefords, the Kais, the Roxtons, Ufferings, the Laygoods, and the Varnas. As the centuries passed, the sons and daughters of these houses intermarried so freely with those descended of the first men that it became impossible to tell them apart. Seldom had a conquest been achieved with less bloodshed. Centuries that followed the Andal conquest were to prove less peaceful. The gardeners included strong men, weak men, clever men, and fools and once even a woman but few had the wisdom and cunning of the three sage kings so the golden peace of garth the golden hand did not come again in that long epoch between the assimilation of the andals and the coming of the dragons the kings of the reach warred constantly with their neighbors in a perpetual struggle for land power and glory the kings of the rock the Storm Kings, the many quarrelsome Kings of Dawn, and the Kings of the Rivers and Hills could all be considered counted amongst their foes, often amongst their allies as well. High Garden reached the apex of his power under King Giles the Third Gardener, who led a glittering host of armoured knights into the Stormlands, smashed the armies of the aged Storm King, and conquered all of the lands north of the Rainwood, save for Storm's End itself, which he besieged without result for two years. Giles might have well have completed his conquest had the King of the Rock not swept down upon the Reach in his absence, forcing him to lift the siege and hurry home to deal with the Westermen. The border war that followed involved three Dornish kings and two from the Riverlands, and it ended with Giles III dead of a bloody flux, and the borders between the realms restored to almost more or less what they had been before the bloodletting began. The Nadir of Gardner power came during the long reign of Garth X, Garth the Greybeard, who succeeded to the crown at the age of seven and died at 96, a reign even longer than that of his forebearer, Garth the Golden Hand. Though vigorous in his youth, Garth X was a vain and frivolous king who surrounded himself with fools and flatterers. Either wise nor clever, his wits abandoned him entirely in his old age, and during the long years of his senality, he became a tool of first one faction, then another, as those around him vied for wealth and power. His grace sighed no sons, but a Lord Peak had married one of his daughters, and a Lord Manderley another, and each was determined to see that their wife should succeed to the throne. The rivalry between them was marked by betrayal, conspiracies, and murder, finally escalating into open war. Other lords joined in on both sides. The Lords of the Reach at sore point, and the King too feeble to grasp what was occurring, much less to stop it, the Storm King and the King of the Rock seized the moment and large swaths of territory, whilst the Dornish raids grew bolder and more frequent. One Dornish king besieged Old Town, whilst another crossed the Manda and sacked High Garden. The Oaken Seat, the living throat that had been the pride of House Gardener for years, beyond count, was chopped to pieces and burned, and a senile King Garth X was found tied to his bed, whimpering and covered in his own filth. Dornish cut his throat, Mercy, one of them said later, then put High Garden to the torch after stripping it of all its wealth. Garth Greybeard upon his new throne as King Mern the Sixth Gardener. Though a man of modest gift, Mern had counsel in his steward, Sir Ormond Tyrrell, who was succeeded in that office by his son, Sir Robert, and later by his grandson, Laurent. Relying on their acumen, Mern the Sixth ruled well, rebuilding High Garden and doing much and more to restore House Gardener and to the Reach. His son, Garth the Eleventh, did the rest, taking such a terrible vengeance upon the Dornishmen that Lord Hightower said afterwards the Red Mountains had been green until Garth painted them with Dornish blood. For the remainder of his long reign, the, the king was known as Garth the Painter. And so it went, king after king, in war and peace. Through it all, the green hand flew proudly across the reach until Mern the Ninth rode out to meet Aegon Targaryen and his sisters upon the Field of Fire. No telling of the history of the reach. Is complete without that of Old Town and its famous and ancient high tower. Old Town, 
that most grand and ancient of cities, still the richest, largest, and most beautiful in all of Westeros, even if the much newer King's Landing has eclipsed it as the most populous. How old is Old Town, truly? Many a maester has pondered that question, but we simply do not know, as the origins of the city are lost in the midst of time and clouded by legend, especially the High Tower itself. Some ignorant septons claim that the Seven themselves laid out the boundaries, others that dragons once roosted on Battle Isle, till the first high tower penned to them. Many small folk believe that the high tower itself simply appeared one day. The full and true history of the founding of Old Town and the high tower will likely never be known. We can state for certainty, however, the men had lived at the mouth of the Honeywine River since the dawn age of Westeros. The oldest runic records confirm this, as do certain fragmentary accounts that have come down from maesters who lived among the children of the forest. One such maester suggests that the settlement at the top of the Whispering Sound began as a trading post, where ships from Valyria, Old Gis, and the Summer Isles put in to replenish their provisions, make repairs, and barter with the elder races. But even if that was the case, mysteries remain, mostly focusing around the High Tower. The stony island where the High Tower stands is known as Battle Isle, even in the oldest records. What battle was fought there? When? Between which lords, which kings, which races? Even the singers are largely silent on these matters. Even more enigmatic to scholars and historians is the great square fortress of black stone that dominates the isle. For most of recorded history, this monumental edifice had served as the foundation and lowest level of the high tower. Yet we know for a certainty that it predates the upper levels of the tower by thousands of years. Who built it? When? Why? Most maces accept that the common wisdom declares it to be of Valyrian construction, for its massive walls and labyrinth-like interiors are all of solid rock, with no hints of joins or mortar, no chisel marks of any kind, a type of construction that is seen elsewhere, most notably in the Dragon Road of the old freehold of Valyria, and the black walls that protect the heart of Alphalantis, and to some extent as well on Dragonstone. As it is well known, they possessed the art of turning stone to liquid with dragon flame, shaping it as they would, then fusing it harder than iron, steel, or granite. If indeed the first fortress is Valyrian, it suggests that the Dragon Lords came to West thousands of years before they carved out their outpost on Dragonstone, long before the coming of the Andals, or even the First Men. If so, did they come seeking trade? Were they slavers, may perhaps looking for giants? Did they seek to learn the magic of the children of the forest with their green seers and their weirwoods? Or was there some darker purpose? Such questions bound even to this day. Long before the doom of Valyria, maesters and archmaesters often travelled to the freehold in search of the answers to these questions, but none were ever found, even in the records of Valyria. Set and Baths claim that the Valyrians came to Westeros because their priests prophesied that the doom of man would come out of the land beyond the narrow sea can safely be dismissed as nonsense, as can many of Septon Bath's questionable beliefs and superstitions. More troubling and more worthy of consideration are the arguments put forth by those who claim the first fortress is not even Valyrian at all. The fused black stone which it is made suggests Valyria, but the plain, unadored style of architecture does not. The dragon lords loved little more than twisting stone into strange, fanciful and and ornate shapes within the narrow twisting windowless passages strike many as being as tunnels rather than halls. It's very easy to get lost amongst their turnings. May perhaps there is no more than a defensive measure designed to confound attackers, but it too is singularly unvalerian in nature. The labyrinthian nature of its interior architecture has led Archmaster Quillian to suggest that the fortress might have been the work of the Maze Makers, a mysterious people who left remnants of their vanished civilization upon Lorath in the Shivering Sea. The notion is intriguing, but raises more questions than any answers. An even more fanciful possibility was put forward a century ago by Maester Theron. Born a bastard on the Iron Islands, the Maester notes a sudden likeness between the black stone of the ancient fortress and that of the sea stone chair, the high seat of House Greyjoy of Pike, whose origins are similarly ancient and mysterious. The Maester's rather incoherent manuscript, Strange Stone, postulates that both fortress and the seat might be the work of a queer 
misshapen race of half-men sired by creatures of the salt sea upon human women, the Deep Ones, as he names them, are the seed from which our legends of the Merlings have grown. He argues while their terrible fathers are the truth behind the Drowned God or the Iron Bomb, the lavish, detailed and somewhat disturbed illustrations included in Strange Stone makes the rare volume fascinating to peruse, but the text is unlegible in parts. Maester Theron had a gift for drawing but little skill with words. In any case, his thesis has no factual basis may safely be dismissed. And thus we find ourselves back whence we came, forced to concede that the beginning of Old Town's Battle Isle and its fortress must forever remain a mystery. The reasons for the abandonment of this fortress and the fate of its builders, whoever they might be, are likewise lost to us. But at some point we know that the Battle Isle and its great stronghold came into the possession of the ancestors of House Hightower, where they first men as most scholars believe today, or that they may perhaps descend from seafarers and traders who had settled at the top of the Whispering Sound in earlier epochs, the men who came before the first men, we cannot know. When first glimpsed in the pages of history, the High Towers are already kings, ruling Old Town from Battle Isle. The first High Tower, the chroniclers tell us, was made of wood and rose some 50 feet above the ancient fortress that was at its foundation. Neither it nor the taller timber towers that followed in the centuries to come were meant to be a dwelling. They are purely beacon towers, built to light a path for trading ships up the fog-shrouded waters of the Whispering Sound. The early high towers lived amidst the gloomy halls, vaults and chambers of the strange stone below. It was only with the building of the fifth tower, the first to be made entirely of stone, that the high tower became a seat worthy of a great house. That tower we are told, rose 200 feet above the harbour. Some say it was designed by Brandon the Builder, whilst others named his son, another Brandon. The king who demanded it and paid for it is remembered as Uther of House Hightower. For thousands of years thereafter, his descendants ruled Old Town and the lands of the Honeywine as kings, and ships from all over the world came to their growing city to trade. As Old Town grew wealthy and powerful, neighbouring lords and petty kings turned their covetous eyes upon its riches, and pirates and breavers from beyond the sea had tales of its splendour as well. Thrice in the space of a single century, the city was taken and sacked by the Dornish king Samuel Dane the Starfire, once again by Quared the Cruel and his Iron Men, and once by Giles the First Gardener, the Woe, who reportedly sold three quarters of the city's inhabitants into slavery, but was unable to breach the defences of the High Tower, which has remained uncaptured to this day. Old Town is located at the mouth of the Honeywine River, in the southwestern side of the Reach, close to its border with Dawn. To enter the port of Old Town from the Sunset Sea, you first need to enter the Whispering Sound. The Rose Road travels from Old Town to High Garden, from where it travels on to King's Landing. Just like its name suggests, Old Town is by far the oldest city in all of Westeros, and for a long time, the most populous. Compared to the more modern and well-planned King's Landing, it is a labyrinth of streets, crisscrossing alleys and markets. Old Town is built in stone, with all its streets cobbled, which can make them wet and slippery on damp days. Most bridges are made of stone as well, although some wooden bridges can still be found. The city itself is surrounded by a massive, thick, high stone walls that have stood and been made taller since the replacing of the original wooden walls during the coming of the Andals. Given its rich history, Old Town is seen as one of the most beautiful places in all of Westeros. This reputation even extends across the narrow sea in Essos. Old Town is described as smelling as flowery, and perfumed as a dowager, and during summer, it steams and swelters during the daytime, but comes alive at night. Its famous foliage include melons, moon blooms, nightshades, peaches, and pomegranates. Many small islands located in Old Town in the middle of the river. The Quill and Tankard, an inn, stands on its own island in the Honeywine, and is famous across Westeros. The river road winds along beside the Honeywine through the heart of the city, while west of the river, the guild halls line the riverbank. Like any city, Old Town still has its more unsavoury aspects. Rat pits and brothels are located in the undercity, hidden away the best they can be. The citadel is located upriver on both sides of the Honeywine, where boys and men gather from all over Westeros to learn, study, and forge a maester's chain. The citadel is considered the greatest seat of learning and knowledge in the known world and has been since before the Targaryen conquest and doom of Illyria. 
Downriver at the starry sept of the Faith of the Seven, the seat of the High Septon for thousands of years, which made Old Town the unquestioned centre of the faith of all of Westeros. Only following the construction of the Great Sept of Baelor in King's Landing, during the second half of the second century after Aegon's conquest, did the Starry Sept lose its status. But many still see Old Town and the Starry Sept as the home and heart of the faith in Westeros. Beside the Sept of Old Town, at least seven more septs honouring the Seven built on the command of Lord Damon Hightower can be found nearby. These include the Sailor's Sept down by the harbour, the Lord's Sept and the Seven's Shrines in their gardens across the Honeywine. Old Town is also home to many mother houses. There can also be found temples of foreign gods, such as the Summer Islands, even a temple of the Red Priests of the Lord of Light. The mighty high tower is a massive stepped lighthouse located on Battle Isle, where the honey wide widens into the whispering sound. The high tower has a great beacon atop, which shows ships the way to port, and is the tallest tower in the world, higher even than the 700 foot wall in the north. For thousands of years, despite the rise of House Gardener and the Kingdom of the Reach, Old Town managed to remain independent under the rules of the Kings of House Hightower, but their independence made them the target of countless raids from the Dornish and Reachmen. Inadequated so, King of the Hightower, Otho II, spent the best part of his reign surrounding Old Town with massive stone walls that have become synonymous with the city, thicker and higher than any seen in Westeros. They have beggared the city for three generations, but such was their strength, the later reavers and would-be conquerors were persuaded to seek for plunder elsewhere, and those who did presume to attack Old Town did so to no avail. But ultimately, the thick walls were not enough to keep Old Town as an independent kingdom. But it was not through war that the High Towers were brought into the Kingdom of the Reach, but through long negotiations and marriage. When Lyman Hightower took to bride the daughter of King Garland II Gardner, whilst giving his own daughter's hand in marriage to her father, the Hightowers became Bannerman to Highgarden, reduced from wealthy but relatively minor kings to the greatest lords of the Reach. Old Town was the last of the ancient realms to bend the knee to Highgarden. Not long after, the King of the Arbor was lost at sea allowing his cousin, King Merrin III, Gardner, to make the Isle part of his domain. By the terms of the marriage treaty, the Gardeners also undertook to defend the city against any assault by land, which freed Lord Lyman Hightower to turn his attention to the great purpose, the building of the Hightower's first great fleet. By the time of Aegon's conquest, Old Town was beyond question the greatest city in all of Westeros, the largest, the richest, and the most populous and the centre of both learning and the faith. Even so, it might well have suffered the same fate as Harrenhal, if not for the close ties between Highgarden and the Starry Sept. For it was the High Septon who persuaded Lord Manfred Hightower to offer no resistance to Aegon Targaryen and his dragons, but instead to open his gates at the Conqueror's approach and do him homage. In turn, he saved the city from the same fate as Harrenhal. House Tyrell of Highgarden is one of the great houses of the Seven Kingdoms, being Lord Paramount of the Manda and Liege Lord to the Reach. A wealthy house that is only surpassed among the great houses by House Lannister, and the Tyrells can fill the greatest armies in all of Westeros. If they call the banners of House Redwine, and thus the Redwine fleet, the Lords of the Shield Isles and the Coastal Lords, they could command a navy that equals if not surpasses the Royal Fleet to King's Landing. Highgarden is an ancient seat and heart of chivalry in the Seven Kingdoms. The Tyrells themselves, defenders of the marches and high marshals of the Reach, are traditionally, they have also been wardens of the South, in addition to Lord Paramount of the Manda. The sigil is a golden rose on green fields, and the words are growing strong. Members of the family tend to have brown curly hair and brown eyes. Unlike their bannermen, the High Towers of Old Town, the Tyrells were never kings, though royal blood does still flow in their veins, as in half a hundred of the other greatest houses in the Reach. Sir Alistair Tyrell, the founder of the line, was an Andal adventurer who became a champion and sworn shield to King Gawain V Gardener, one of the famous Three Sage Kings. His eldest son became a notable knight as well, only to die in a tourney. His second son, Garth, was more of a bookish man and never achieved knighthood, choosing to serve as a royal steward instead. It is from him that, that today's Tyrells descend. Garth Tyrell and his son, Leo, performed their duties so ably that the gardeners made the office of High Steward hereditary. Through the centuries, many generations of Tyrells served in that capacity. Many became close confidants and advisors to their kings. Some also acted as Castilians in times of war. At least one ruled the Reach as regent during the minority of King Garland of Sith Gardner. King Giles III declared the Tyrells to be my most loyal, leal servants, and King Myrna VI was so pleased with them 
that he gave Sir Robert de Rao the hand of his youngest daughter in marriage, thereby allowing their sons, grandsons and all the generations to follow to claim descent from Garth Greenhand. That was the first marriage between House Gardner and House Tyrell, but nine more unions between the two houses followed in the centuries to come. But it was not their royal blood that made Aegon Targaryen choose to name the Tyrells as Lords of Highgarth, Wands of the South and Lord Paramounts of the Reach after King Mern the Ninth, the last of the Gardner kings died along with all his sons upon the field of fire during Aegon's conquest. Those honours were won by the prudence of Harlan Tyrell, who opened the gates of Highgarden to Aegon's approach and pledged himself and his family to House Targaryen. Afterwards, a number of the other great houses of the Reach complained bitterly about being made vassals of an up-jump steward and insisted that their own blood was far nobler than that of the Tyrells. It cannot be denied that the Oak Hearts of Old Oak, the Florence of Brightwater Keep, the Rowans of Golden Grove and the Peaks of Starpike and the Red Wines of the Arbor all had older and more distinguished lineages than the Tyrells and closer blood ties to House Gardner as well. The protests were no avail however, maybe perhaps in part because all the houses had taken up arms against Aegon and his sisters on the field of fire, whereas the Tyrells had not. Then you may also have to consider the might and power held by House Hightower, who were not having many blood ties to the Gardner kings, can boast of their own royal blood being the kings of Old Town for centuries before joining the Kingdom of the Reach. Also, it should be noted that the High Towers did yield Old Town without a fight, and opening the gates to welcome Aegon. The reasons why Aegon did not choose House High Tower are debated even to this day. Aegon Targaryen's judgement in this proved sound. Lord Harlan proved a capable steward for the Reach, though he only ruled until 5 AC, when he disappeared with his army in the deserts of Dawn during Aegon's first Dornish War. His son Theo Tyrell was understandably reluctant to become involved in any further attempts to conquer Dawn, but eventually became embroiled when the conflict spilled out beyond the Red Mountains. When the Targaryens at last made peace with Dawn, Lord Theo turned his attention consolidating Tyrell power by arranging a council of septons and maesters to examine and firmly dismiss some of the more persistent of the claims to Highgarden by those who insisted the seat was rightfully theirs. As Lords of Highgarden and Wardens of the South, the descendants of these upjump stewards rank amongst the most powerful lords of the realm and they have been called on to fight beneath the banner of the Targaryens on many occasions. For most of those occasions they have come as called, though wisely they played no part in the Dance of the Dragons as the young Lord Tyrell was at the time a babe in a swaddling cloth, and his mother and the Castilian chose to keep Highgarden out of the dreadful bloodbath. Later, when King Daron I Targaryen, the young dragon, marched on dawn, the Tyrells proved their valour by leading the main thrust over the prince's pass. Having said faithfully, if perhaps too boldly, Lord Lionel Tyrell was given charge of Dawn after the young dragon returned, triumphant King's Landing. His lordship succeeded in keeping the Dornishman pacified for some time, only to suffer a gruesome death in the infamous Bed of Scorpions. His murder ignited the rising that swept Dawn, eventually bringing about the death of the young dragon at the age of 18. Of the Tyrells who succeeded the ill-fated Lord Lionel at Highgarden in the years since, the most notable was Lord Leo Tyrell, a tawny champion remembered to this day as Lord Longthorn. Many considered him the finest jouster to ever coach a lance. Lord Leo also won distinction during the first Blackfyre Rebellion, winning notable victories against Damon Blackfyre's adherents in the Reach, though his forces were unable to gather quick enough to arrive in time for the Battle of the Red Grass Field. The present Lord of Highgarden at the start of the main book series is Mace Tyrell, who fought loyally for House Targaryen during Robert's Rebellion, defeating Robert Baratheon himself at the Battle of Ashford, and later besieging his brother Stannis in Storm's End for the better part of a year. With the death of Mad King Aerys II and his son Prince Rhaegar, however, Lord Mace laid down his sword and is today once again Warden of the South and a leal servant to King Robert and the Iron Throne. Highgarden is the Grand Castle which serves as the seat of House Tyrell and the regional capital of the Reach. It lies on the Manda, where the Ocean Road meets the Rose Road, making it an important crossroad between parts of Dawn, Old Town, and the King's Road that leads to King's Landing. Mace Tyrell is currently the Lord of Highgarden during the time of the main book series. The Great Castle of Highgarden, the ancient seat of the Tyrell Lords and the Garden of Kings for countless centuries before them, sits atop a verdant hill overlooking the broad and tranquil waters of the Manda. Seen from afar, the castle looks so much part of the land that one could think that it had grown there rather than being built. Many consider Highgarden to be the most beautiful castle in all of the Seven Kingdoms, 
a claim that only the men of the Vale seem to dispute, with their preference obviously being their own eerie. The hill from which High Garden raises is neither steep nor stony, broad in extent, with gentle slopes and a pleasing symmetry. From the castle's walls and towers, a man can see for leagues in all directions, given the reach is mostly flat terrain, across orchards and meadows and fields of flowers, including the golden roses of the reach that have long been the sigil of House Tyrell. High Garden is gridded by three concentric ring circles of curtain walls made of finely dressed white stone and protected by towers as slender and graceful as maidens. Each wall is higher and thicker than the one below it. Between the outermost wall that encircles the foot of the hill and the middle wall above it can be found High Garden's famed bizarre maze, a vast and complicated labyrinth of thorns and hedges, maintained for centuries for the pleasure and delight of the castle's occupants and guests and for defensive purposes. For intruders unfamiliar with the maze cannot easily find their way through its traps and dead ends to reach the castle gates. Within the castle walls, greenery bounds and the keeps are surrounded by gardens. Arbors, pools, fountains, courtyards, man-made waterfalls, ivy covers the old buildings, and grapes and climbing roses snake up the side of the newer, sturdier walls and towers. Flowers bloom everywhere. The keep is a palace like few other, filled with statues, colonnades, and fountains. High Garden's tallest tower, round and slender, look down upon the neighbours far more ancient, square and grim in appearance, the oldest of them dating back to the age of heroes. The rest of the castle is more recent construction, much of it built by King Mern the Sith after the destruction of the original structures by the Dornish during the reign of Garth Greybeard. The gods, both old and new, are well served in High Garden. The splendour of the castle sept, with its rows of stained glass windows celebrating the seven and the unambiguous Garth Greenhand is rivalled only by that of the Starry Sept in Old Town and the Great Sept of Baylor in King's Landing, and High Garden's lush green godswood is almost as renowned, for in place of a single heart tree, it boasts three towering, graceful ancient weirwoods, whose limbs have grown so entangled over the centuries that they appear to almost be a single tree with three trunks, reaching for each other above a tranquil pool. Legend has it these trees, known in the reach as the Three Singers, were planted by Garth Greenhand himself. High Garden is filled with flowers, singers, pipers, fiddlers and harpers. The stables have a fine selection of horses and there are countless pleasure boats to sail along the Manda. There are fields of golden roses that can stretch as far as the eye can see, with fruits grown nearby including melons, peaches and fire plums. No seat in the Seven Kingdoms has become more celebrated in song than High Garden, and small wonder for the Tyrells and the gardens before them have made their court a place of culture and music and high art. In the days before the conquest, the kings of the Reach and their queens presided over tourneys of love and beauty, where the greatest knights of the Reach competed for the love of the fairest maidens, not only with feats of arms, but with songs, poetries, demonstrations of virtue, piety, and chaste devotion. The greatest champions, men as pure and honourable, virtuous as they were, gilded arms, were honoured with invitations to join the Order of the Green Hand. Though the last members of that noble order perished beside their king on the field of fire, save in White Harbour, where the Knights of the House Manderley still profess membership, their traditions are still remembered in the Reach, where the Tyrells continue to uphold all that is best in knighthood and chivalry. Their tawnies of the Field of Roses in the reign of Jaehaerys I, the Old King, was famed far and wide as the greatest tawny in a generation, and many other great tawnies have been held in the Reach in more recent days. House Tarly is one of the oldest noble houses in the Reach, and one that has first men origins from the age of heroes. Their banner is a striding huntsman in red on a green field. The Tarleys claim descent from twin sons of the legendary Garth Greenhand, Herden the Horn and Harlan the Hunter. It is said they built a castle atop Horn Hill and took to wife the beautiful woods witch who dwelt there, sharing her favours for a hundred years. The brothers did not age so long as they laid with the woods witch whenever the moon was full. In the age of a hundred kingdoms, before the Reach was united under the kings of the Reach, House Gardener of High Garden, House Tarly was part of the Kingdom of the Western Marches, which extended from Horn Hill to Nightsong. The castle at Horn Hill, like most at South of the Neck, has a sept within its walls. While the walls of the castle are far less formidable than the likes of High Garden and Old Town, history has proven they can withstand attack. A large pond lies below the castle, and the woods round Horn Hill are teeming with game, which led to the Tarly's love of hunting, as shown by the huntsmen on their banner. 
Many Targaryen kings have spent time at Horn Hill, including Aegon the Conqueror, King Jaehaerys, and Queen Alysanne in 54 AC, and 122 AC, Rhaenyra Targaryen made a stop at Horn Hill during her tour of the Southern Kingdoms. One of the first notable Tarleys was a Samwell Tarly, known to many as Savage Sam. When the Vulture King began raiding the Dornish marches in 37 AC, Lord Oris Baratheon of Storm's End was joined by the Marcher Lords in what became the Second Dornish War. The Vulture King soon abandoned his siege of Nightsong, but Lord Harmon Dundarian and Lady Ellen Caron cut off his retreat, while Samwell suddenly appeared in the Dornish line of march with several thousand knights and archers. What followed became known in the songs as the Vulture Hunt. It is claimed that Savage Sam's Valyrian steel sword, the pride of House Tarly for generations, Heartsbane, was crimson from hilt to point with the blood of a dozen Dornish outlaws he had slain himself. Heartsbane became the prized possession of House Tarly. The Dornish host was defeated, and the Vulture King was taken alive and tied naked between two posts by Sam, wherein he died of exposure soon after. Samwell was among those granted gold and honours and offices by the grateful King Aenys Targaryen, his bravery and role during the war. The next major Tarly of note in the pages of history is Randall Tarly, who played a key role during Robert's Rebellion, being an important commander for the Targaryen Loyalist forces. Randall, described as a lean, balding man with a short, bristling grey beard, shrewd to a point and capable, given Randall spent most of his youth at war, he prized courage and martial ability in others above all else. In turn, this view would cause him to despise his eldest son, Samwell, who he saw as a coward and soft, and strongly favoured his younger son, Dickon, who was much more fierce and robust than his elder brother. By the start of the main book series, Randall would send Samwell to join the Night's Watch in order to make Dickon his heir, threatening to kill Sam should he ever return to Horn Hill. During the War of Five Kings, House Tarly and Randall first allied themselves to Renly Baratheon, given that he had married the daughter of their liege lord, Mace Tyrell of Highgarden. But after the assassination of Renly Baratheon, and most of his forces choosing to follow Stannis in the aftermath, Randall would stay loyal to House Tyrell and join their alliance with Tywin Lannister, fighting in the Battle of Blackwater Bay and stopping Stannis from capturing King's Landing. For the rest of the War of Five Kings, Randall and the men of House Tarly would be in the Riverlands fighting Robb Stark's forces. His most notable achievement during this time was the capture of Maidenpool, wiping out most of the northern forces holding it. After the death of Tywin Lannister, Kevin Lannister suggested to Queen Cersei that she should name Randall the new Hand of the King in her father's place. But this notion was dismissed, given the close connection between House Tarly and House Tyrell, and the clear loyalty Randall has shown to them. Later, Randall leaves Maidenpool, returning to the King's Landing upon receiving news of the arrest of Marjorie Tyrell. He receives custody of her and her cousins after swearing a holy oath to return them for trial. As part of Lord Regent Kevin Lannister's efforts to assuage the men of the Reach, Lord Tarly was named Justicar on the small council of King Tommen I Baratheon. So far, the highest office any member of House Tarly has held. While we don't know the fate of House Tarly and Randall, until Winds of Winter is published, it's fair to say that in the wake of Kevin Lannister's death, Randall Tarly could be poised to play a big role during the coming trial of Marjorie Tyrell. House Redwine of the Arbor is one of the larger and more powerful noble houses sworn to House Tyrell of Highgarden. Their seat is the Arbor, an island located off the southwestern most part of Westeros in the proximity of Old Town. The Red Wines are best known for making the best wine in Westeros. Wines such as an Arbor Red are sought after even in the most eastern parts of Essos, such as Slaver's Bay and beyond. The Red Wines control the Red Wine Fleet, the largest fleet in Westeros by the time of the main books. But historically, the Red Wine Fleet has been comparable in size as the fleets of House Valarian before the Dance of the Dragons, and as well as some of the other larger Ironborn fleets. It typically contains about 200 warships, five times as many merchant carracks, wine corks, trading galleys, and whalers who trade up and down the narrow sea, as well as most major port cities in Essos. The sigil of House Red Wine is a burgundy grape cluster on blue, symbolizing the famed wines of the arbor. And as of A Dance with Dragons, the fifth book in the main series, the words are not yet known. By the time of the start of the main books, the current lord of the arbor is Paxter Redwine, who is married to his cousin, Mina Tyrell, the sister of his liege lord, Mace Tyrell. Paxter's elderly aunt is Lady Olena Redwine, the queen of thorns, and is the mother 
of Mace and Mina Terrell. It is said that House Redwine claims descent from Gilbert of the Vines, one of the many children of the legendary Garth Greenhand. House Redwine ruled as Kings of the Arbor until their last monarch was lost at sea, allowing his cousin, King Merlin the Third Gardener, to make the Isle a part of the Kingdom of the Reach. Historically, even before joining the Kingdom of the Reach, fleets from the Arbor would work with those of Old Town to protect the Reach from naval attacks during the coming of the Andals. The two would work together due to their mutual benefit of keeping the Red Wine Strait protected from the Andal invaders, but in more recent history, the Ironborn Reavers. It is said that Aegon the Conqueror and his elder sister, and later on his wife, Visenya Targaryen, may have spent some time hawking on the Arbor. In their youth prior to Aegon's conquest. This would have occurred around the same time they visited Old Town. After the Targaryen conquest of Westeros, Visenya and Rhaenys Targaryen helped arrange for the eldest son of Lord Lauren Lannister to marry a girl from House Redwine, something which began a trend of the sons and daughters of House Redwine marrying into the great houses of the Seven Kingdoms. With the Vlarian fleet still relatively small after Aegon conquered the Seven Kingdoms, it was the Redwine fleet that aided Aegon in his invasion of the Iron Islands in 2 AC. During the reign of Maegor the Cruel, the Redwine did eventually turn against Maegor, in 48 AC, Maegor's successor, King Jaehaerys, named Lord Manfred Redwine as Lord Admiral and Master of Ships in 50 AC. This was somewhat a controversial choice at the time, as traditionally, since Aegon's conquest, the role of Master of Ships was given to Lord of the Tides. As a result, Manfred had a rivalry with Daemon Valerian. Manfred was the man who proposed the tourney for the completion of the Dragon Pit, and his sons Robert and Rickard distinguished themselves in that tournament in 55 AC. Three years later, Manfred's youngest son, Ryan Redwine, was crowned champion in a tourney at King's Landing on the anniversary of the King's coronation. Following the shivers, the illness that ravaged the whole of Westeros in 59 AC, Sir Robert was appointed commander of the City Watch of King's Landing, and his younger brother Ryan joined the King's Guard of Jaehaerys. In a tourney at Old Oak in 73 AC, Sir Rickard defeated Prince Balon Targaryen, Jaehaerys' second son, who was disguised as the Mystery Knight. Rickard granted knighthood to the prince after he was unmasked. Ryan was also the champion at Old Town in 89 AC. And he was named co-champion with Sir Clement Crabb in King's Landing in 98 AC. Sir Ryan, by then Lord Commander of the King's Guard, was named Hand of the King as well after the death of Septon Bath in 98 AC. But the legendary knight was poorly suited for this position and eventually replaced. During the Dance of the Dragons, the Arbor declared for King Aegon II and the Greens, not surprising given their close connection to Old Town and thus House Hightower, the house of Aegon's mother, Alicent, and Aegon's hand and grandfather, Otto. Years later, after the Dance of the Dragons was finished, a Lord Redwine was part of the group who helped escort the High Septon to the capital for the coronation and wedding of King Aegon III during the Regency period of Aegon III. House Redwine were married in to House Hightower many times, and Martin Hightower served as Lord Redwine's squire at the Arbor. The second son of Lord Unwin Peak, the infamous Hand of the King to Aegon III during the Regency, squired for Lord Redwine before drowning in a sailing accident. Patricia Redwine was also in attendance at the Maiden Days Cattle Show in 133 AC to help find a wife for King Aegon III, being one of hundreds of girls it is not surprising she was not selected. During Lord Alan Valarian's wars with the Ironborn, Lord Redwine promised Alan, the Lord of the Tides, 30 war galleys from the Redwine fleet when he sailed to confront Dalton Greyjoy, Lord of the Iron Islands. Alan eventually departed for the Westerlands after waiting at Old Town for the Redwine fleet for some time. The Valarian fleet later met the Arbor ships while returning south after the death of Dalton Greyjoy, and Lord Redwine briefly hosted Alan Oakenfist at the Arbor before he carried on to Dawn in the later years of the reign of the Mad King, Aerys Targaryen, in the build-up to Robert Baratheon's rebellion. Bethany Redwine was to marry Sir Brendan Tully, but he refused the match, and so she was wed to Lord Mathis Rowan instead. On the journey to Castle Rock for the brokerage of their marriage, Prince Oberyn Martell and Princess Elia Martell spent some time at the Arbor. Later, during Robert's rebellion, Pax the Redwine joined his cousin and good brother Mace Tyrell in staying loyal to King Aerys Targaryen. His main contribution to the war was the naval blockade of Storm's End during Mance Tyrell's siege of the castle, ferrying men across the Blackwater Bay and blocking Ship Baker Bay. House Manderley of White Harbour in the north and formerly of Dunstanbury in the Reach are one of the biggest noble families in Westeros, having played a huge role in the history of the Seven Kingdoms. Their banner is a white merman with dark green hair, beard and tail, carrying a black trident over a blue-green field. 
As of a dance with dragons, we do not currently know that house words. House Manderley is one of the most unique houses in Westeros, being one of the few to relocate from their traditional seat of Dunstanbury in the Reach to White Harbour in the north after they were exiled from the Reach by the then Kings of the Reach, House Gardener, wherein the Kings of Winter, House Stark, accepted the Manderleys, granting them the small castle of the Wolf's Den, which House Manderley would then develop over the centuries into White Harbour, the only true city in the north. Given their relocation from the Reach, they have several customs that differ from the rest of the north, namely the Manderleys continue to follow the Faith of the Seven, as they did in the south. They also claim and maintain membership in the Order of the Green Hand. Although the Knightly Order was destroyed at the Field of Fire during Aegon's conquest, the Mandalees are a long and ancient line who can trace their lineage far back to the First Men and the legendary figure Garth Greenhand. They once lived along the banks of the mighty river Manda in the Kingdom of the Reach, and some claim the river was named after them, while others that the river gave them their name. They historically have a long-running rivalry with House Peak, even to the modern day. During the reign of the Gardener Kings in the Reach, King Gawain III Gardener persuaded Lords Manderley and Peak to accept his judgement on a quarrel and do fealty for their lands, without any bloodshed. Like other houses of the Reach, the Mandalees presumably converted from the old gods of the First Men to the Faith of the Seven after the Gardeners welcomed the Andals into their kingdom. However, their First Men heritage would later help them assimilate to life in the North after their relocation, near the end of the long reign of King Garth X. A problem arose with the succession, as the elderly and senile Garth had sired no sons and only daughters, one of whom had married a Lord Mandalay and another to a Lord Peak. Both lords were determined their own wife should succeed to the throne at Highgarden, and the rivalry between them was marked by betrayal, conspiracy, and murder, and finally escalated into open war, with other lords joining the cause on both sides. The anarchy that followed lasted almost a decade, until Sir Osmond Tyrell, the High Steward of Highgarden, made common cause with the other lords of the Reach, who had grown tired of the two houses' ongoing and never-ending conflict, and defeated the Peaks and the Mandalees in separate battles. Osmond then placed a distant cousin of the late Garth X on the throne as King Mern VI Gardner, with neither of the wives of Lord Peak or Mandalay ever voicing their claim again. At some point, House Mandalay overreached itself, although the exact details of how are lost to the pages of time, but they were driven from the Reach by the gardeners. According to Maester Yandel, the exile of House Mandalay is credited to a Lord Lomir Peak on the behest of King Pericon III Gardner, who feared the Mandalay's ever-growing influence and power in the Reach. Yet no specific one incident can be cited as the cause, but ultimately this led to House Peak being granted the Mandalay's seat at Dunstanbury and all the lands that came with it. Bringing all their wealth with them, the Mandalays fled to the north, where they were welcomed by the Starks of Winterfell as their own bannermen. The Starks awarded the Wolf's Den to the Mandalays and tasked them with defending the White Knife in return for swearing an oath that they would always be loyal subjects to House Stark. This history instilled the Mandalays with a great loyalty to their new liege lords, even into the time of the main book series, with House Mandalay being one of the most powerful and loyal bannermen for House Stark. When exactly the Mandalays came north, is unknown. In 211 AC, Lady Rowan Webber dated the flight of the Mandalays as having occurred a thousand years ago. Lord Godric Borrell finds the period to be no more than 900 years, before 300 AC. However, both Wyler Mandalay as well as Maester Yandel dates the arrival of the Mandalays to the north a bit further back, a thousand years before the conquest. So there is no clear consensus on when the Mandalays were forced out of the reach. In the direct aftermath of Aegon's conquest, Sir Warwick Mandalay and Queen Visenya Targaryen suppressed the Sisterman's rebellion with ease and Lord Stephen Sunderland's as a result said the son to be fostered with the Mandalays. Mara Mandalay was one of many companions to Queen Alessandra Targaryen at Dragonstone in 55 AC. Her father, Lord Theomor Mandalay, would later go on to host Alessandra in 58 AC, when the Queen visited White Harbour as part of her royal progress, with Mara's sister, Jessamine, serving as her cupbearer. Much later, Theomor Mandalay was to marry Princess Viserra Targaryen, the daughter of King Jaehaerys and Queen Alessandra in 86 AC, but the high-spirited and wild young girl died after falling from a horse while racing drunkardly through the streets of King's Landing. House Manderley would then go on to support Princess Rhaenys Targaryen in the Great Council of 101 at Harrenhal, like many of the other northern houses. However, they were still in the minority in that regard. 
During the Dance of the Dragons, Prince Jacaris Valarian travelled to White Harbour and Winterfell and convinced the North to join the Blacks. After agreeing that his youngest daughter should wed Prince Joffrey Valarian, once fighting ended, Lord Desmond Manderley sent warriors, led by his sons Sir Medric and Sir Torrent, to support Rhaenyra Targaryen. The courtly brothers were well regarded in King's Landing, especially when compared to the other Northmen, who served in the host of Lord Cregan Stark. Torrent would then serve as one of the regents of King Aegon III after the war, resigning in 132 AC, after the deaths of his father and brother, but Lord Torrent would eventually again serve Aegon III as his hand of the king, until 136 AC when the regency ended and he dismissed Lord Manderley and his regency council. As shown through history, House Manderley would marry in to the Stark bloodline many times over the years, creating a close familial bond between the two houses, entrenching the loyalty House Manderley has for the Starks even deeper. In much more recent history, House Manderley was present at the Tawny at Harrenhal in 281 AC, and later, when Lord Eddard Stark called his banners to join in Robert Baratheon's rebellion against King Aerys Targaryen, the Mad King, Lord Wyman Manderley led his men south, fighting in the Battle of the Trident. House Peak of Starpike is a noble house in the Reach. They blazon their arms with three black castles on orange. The three black castles symbolised the three castles that House Peak once owned. Starpike, Dunstanbury, and Whitegrove. They infamously gained Dunstanbury after having driven the Mandalays from the Reach at the behest of the House Gardener, the Kings of the Reach. This was the final blow in a centuries-long rivalry between House Mandalay and House Peak. It is unknown what their coat of arms consisted of before their accumulation of Whitegrove and Dunstanbury, as the arms were presumably different before this, giving each castle in their heraldry representing each holding. Given their location in the southern end of the Reach, in the Dornish Marches, House Peak is counted amongst the Marcher Lords. Given this, the men of House Peak are known for their martial ability, alongside a deep-rooted distrust and dislike for the Dornish, whom they have fought countless times within the Red Mountains and whilst defending from raiders within the Reach. House Peak is an ancient house of First Men origin, like many houses that come from the Reach. According to legends, the Peaks, Florence and Balls are each descended from one of the three husbands of Floris the Fox, one of the daughters of Garth Greenhand. According to the myth, Floris kept three husbands, each ignorant of the existence of the others. How she managed this, or how this knowledge was passed down, is not known, but her sons became the founders of House Florence, Ball and Peak. In some tales of the Reach, Lan the Clever, the founder of House Lannister, who famously took Casterly Rock from the Castellies, was a bastard born to Floris. However, some tales assert he was born to her sister, Rowan Golden Tree, meaning Lan would not be so closely linked to House Peak in this regard. The Peaks were, for much of their history, historically rivals of House Manderley, then of Dunstanbury. During the reign of the Gardener Kings in the Reach, King Gwain the Fat persuaded Lord Manderley and Lord Peak to accept his judgement on their quarrel and do fealty for their lands without any bloodshed. But this was only a temporary solution to the deep-rooted hatred between the two houses. Near the end of the long reign of Garth Greybeard, a serious problem arose with the succession, as Garth had sired no sons, and only daughters, one of whom had married a Lord Manderley, and another a Lord Peak. Both lords were determined their own wives should succeed to the throne, and the rivalry between them was marked only by betrayal, conspiracy, and murder, and finally it escalated into open war, with other lords joining the causes of both sides. The anarchy that followed lasted almost ten years, until Sir Osmond Tyrell, the High Steward of Highgarden, made common cause with other disgruntled lords of the Reach, and defeated both the Peaks and the Mandalays in separate battles. Sir Osmond then placed a distant cousin of the late Garth Greybeard on the throne, who ascended as Myrne VI Gardener. Neither the Peak nor the Mandalay claimant pressed their claims again, and those branches of the family were supposedly removed from the line of succession entirely to keep both houses away from vying for the Gardener crown. House Mandalay was driven into exile from the Reach by Lord Lomir Peak, upon the behest of King Perricon III Gardener, who feared the Mandalays' ever-swelling power in the Reach. Thanks to the tactically sound position of their lands in the kingdom, this allowed House Peak to acquire the Mandalay seat of Dunstanbury, adding it to their growing domain with House Peak already holding Starpike and Whitegrove. Lord Lomir's daughter married Perricon III's son, Gwain, and was the seventh Peak maiden to become a queen of all the Reach. As a powerful house in the Reach, they have in turn married into several other powerful and ancient houses. Peak daughters have married into House Redwine, Rowan, Costain, Oakheart, Osgrey, 
Florence and Hightower over the centuries, adding to the complex family tree that binds near all the houses in the Reach who descend from Garth Greenhand. House Peak would be a part of the defence of the Reach during Aegon's conquest of Westeros when King Mern Gardner called his banners. House Peak answered the call, unlike many of the Reach lords. Lord Armin Peak and his sons all perished upon the Field of Fire, alongside their king. However, unlike House Gardner, House Peak did not go extinct as a result of the battle. Unlike the station House Peak had enjoyed under the Gardner kings, they had no blood connection with the new lords of High Garden. House Tyrell, and thus had no reason to be favoured, therefore starting their slow decline during the Targaryen era of Westeros. Lord Uther Peak ruled during the reign of King Jaehaerys I Targaryen and married one of Queen Alysanne's companions, Lady Prunella Kaltegar. The match was arranged by Queen Alysanne herself and was seen as one of her best, with both House Kaltegar and Peak benefiting greatly from it. It would be one of many matches Queen Alysanne would make over her life something she took great joy in. At the Great Council of 101 AC, Lord Peak voted for Prince Viserys Targaryen over Princess Rhaenys Targaryen, resulting in Viserys being named Prince of Dragonstone and heir to King Jaehaerys. Later then in the Dance of the Dragons, Lord Unwin Peak supported the Greens, given House Peak's connections to House Hightower. He took command of the Green Army on the march towards King's Landing from Old Town after the Second Battle of Tumbleton and led its retreat. Unwin would play a huge role in both battles of Tumbleton and the conspiracy of the Bloody Caltrops, events that would play a huge part in the aftermath of the Dance of the Dragons and ultimately the end of the war. During the Regency period of King Aegon III Targaryen, after the Dance of the Dragons had come to an end, after the death of Lord Corlys Velaryon, the Sea Snake, Lord Unwin was given a position as one of King Aegon III's regents. He eventually became protector of the realm and also hand of the king, which he later resigned when the king would not marry his daughter, Mariella Peak. However, Anwin Peak would be surrounded in much controversy, being suspected as being the mastermind behind the later attempt on the king's life, that resulted in the secret siege of Magos Holfast and the deaths of many of the men and women who owed their positions to Anwin. While many of his known loyal followers were involved in the conspiracy, it could never be proven that Anwin was involved, or even the mastermind. The records show his fingerprints were all over the conspiracy. Lord Gorman Peak was a fierce supporter of Damon Blackfire and was considered one of the finest knights during the reign of King Daron II. After the Peak chose the side of House Blackfire in the failed First Blackfire Rebellion, they had two of their castles stripped from them, leaving them with only Starpike. This would again push their fall in the Targaryen era even further. However, it should be noted they never removed the two castles they lost from the heraldry, even into the Baratheon era. Gorman was later part of Daemon II Blackfire's entourage at the White Wall's wedding tourney in 212 AC and was subsequently executed for treason. The Peaks rose against the Iron Throne again in the Peak Uprising in 233 AC. King Makar I Targaryen's helm was crushed by a rock hurled from the battlements of Starpike. Lord Robert Rain and Sir Tywood Lannister were also killed in the storming of Starpike. In the aftermath of Starpike, Roger Rain, the new Lord of Castamir, took vengeance for his father Robert's death by slaughtering seven captive peaks before Prince Aegon Targaryen prevented him from harming any others. In terms of the main book series, very little is known of House Peak. In A Feast for Crows, we know that Lord Titus Peak is married to Lady Margot Lannister, a distant cousin of the main Casterly Rock Lannisters, and in A Dance with Dragons, Laswell, Tormund, and Pikewood Peak are among exiles in Essos and members of the Golden Company in support of Aegon Targaryen, the son of Rhaegar Targaryen, thought dead at the end of Robert's Rebellion. Laswell Peak is later among those men sent to take the Rain House on Cape Wrath. House Osgrey of Steadfast and formerly of Coldnote, is a once noble house from Steadfast in the Reach. They are sworn to House Rowan, with their current lands bordering those of House Weber and House Stackhouse. Despite their storied history and pride of their ancestry, the Osgreys have not been lords in centuries, now being nothing but landed knights, and ones of low fortune at that, though they had once been counted amongst the greatest houses of the Reach, both in terms of their political power and history. Their traditional heraldry is a checky line green and gold, on a white field, and as of a dance with dragons, their motto has not yet appeared. In terms of their position in the world of ice and fire, they mostly play a huge role in the second Duncan Egg short story, The Swan Sword. 
It is documented in the citadel of Old Town that House Osgrave was established at least a thousand years before Aegon's conquest. However, some maces speculate their history could date back further than this, but if this is the case, there is no record left anywhere of it. The family used to be marshals of the North March under House Gardner, the former kings of the Reach, and enjoyed much prestige and position during the Gardner era. At that time, they possessed four castles and were receiving fealty by a score of lesser lordlings and at least a hundred landed knights. The largest and most well-known castle was Coldmoat, which was raised by Lord Perwin Osgrey. The Osgreys were a prominent family who intermarried with great families within the Reach and also much further afield, including houses such as the Florence, the Swans, the Tarbacks, the High Towers, and the Blackwoods. On one occasion, an Osgrey, Sir Wilbert, the Little Lion, killed Lancel IV, King of the Rock, but then later died of his injuries, but he thereby repelled an invasion of the Reach. After the last Gardener King was killed on the Field of Fire, and Aegon the Conqueror had raised House Tyrell to Lords Paramount of the Reach, House Osgrave's prominence began to diminish over time. It was a slow but persistent, steady decline. During the reign of Maegor the Cruel, Lord Ormond Osgrave lost their main holding of Coldmoat when he spoke out against King Maegor the Cruel for his suppression of the poor fellows and the warrior's sons during the Faith Uprisings. House Osgrave were among a slew of large and minor houses to have lands and titles stripped from them during the reign of Maegor. It was also during this time that House Osgrave had at least one cadet branch at Leafy Lake, but by 210 AC they seemed to have become extinct. Adam Osgrey, the son of the last Lord Osgrey, Lord Eustace of Steadfast, served at Coldmoat as a page and a squire for House Weber, who were awarded the castle and its attached lands after they were stripped from House Osgrey. So Eustace Osgrey once visited Coldmoat to suggest a marriage between his son Adam and Rowan Weber, the daughter of Wyman Weber, who was at the time the current Lord Weber. But the Lord of Coldmoat refused Eustace and given House Osgrey's now low standing. In return for House Osgrey's support in the first Blackfire Rebellion of 196 AC, Damon the First Blackfire promised to restore Coldmoat and all its attached lands to Eustace, should the rebellion prevail. But as any scholar of history knows, the first Blackfire Rebellion ended with the death of Damon Blackfire in the Battle of the Red Grass Field. Adam Osgrey would also lose his life fighting in the battle, along with his two brothers, something that would deeply haunt his father, Sir Eustace. After the defeat in the Battle of the Red Grass Field, Eustace was forgiven by King Daron II Targaryen, but his daughter Alessandre was taken to King's Landing as a hostage to ensure House Osgrey's loyalty. His wife would later commit suicide after the loss of all of their children. This ultimately made Eustace the last of his line, meaning House Osgrey. This old and proud house would die with him, a fate and punishment any lord would fear. House Osgrey once had four castles in total, whilst the greatest of which was Coldmoat. They held lands from Nunny to Cobble Cover and controlled towns like Dosk, Little Dosk and Brandy Bottom. As well as the caves at Daring Downs, they also held both sides of Leafy Lake and the Horseshoe Hills. At the time of the Duck and Egg adventure, the Sworn Sword, in 210 AC, the family had only one castle left, Stanfast, a small and run-down castle that's fit for a landed knight, not a former lord. During 210 AC, Sir Eustace entered into a conflict with his neighbour, Lady Rowan Weber, the head of House Weber, over the rights to the border stream, the Checky Water. The Checky Water was vital to the water supply of the small folk living on Osgrey land, along as supplying Steadfast itself. Lady Rowan had dammed the water further upstream in order to irrigate her lands and crops, as well as supply water to her moat. This new conflict was decided by a trial by battle, in which the champion of House Osgrey, Sir Duncan the Tall, who would later be counted amongst the finest Lord Commanders of the Kingsguard Westeros ever saw, defeated Lucas Itchfield, the champion of Lady Weber, in single combat. By all accounts, it was a duel for the ages and a close-run affair. After the fight, Rowan and Eustace reconciled, and as a way to end their water dispute, Rowan married Eustace, with him becoming Lord of Coldmoat once again. But it is not known if he became the ruling lord, or only a consort to Lady Rowan. Thus, the lands that were under the domain of House Weber may or may not have been restored to House Osgrey. But regardless, Rowan and Eustace would have no children, with Eustace dying sometime before 219 AC, and Rowan later going on to marry Gerald Lannister. House Weber of Coldmoat is a noble house from Coldmoat in the Reach. Sworn to House Rowan, their lands used to border those of House Osgrey, with their main castle of Coldmoat once being the primary seat of the Osgreys, with it being their ancestral home. 
The banner is a black field with a spotted spider on a silver web with their words currently not known as of a dance with dragons. It appears by the time of the main books, House Weber has fallen from their once high position, no longer holds Cold Moat, or perhaps any lands at all in Westeros. The castle of Cold Moat was located less than two leagues away from House Osgrey's newer seat of Stanfast had granulated outer walls standing exactly 33 feet high, with towers at each of its corners. It's a highly defensible castle, as it's surrounded by a moat that encircles the castle by 211 AC. By 211 AC, the waters of the nearby Chequi River were dammed, with part of the water being used to keep the moat filled even during the harshest drought conditions. Due to the fact that Cold Moat once belonged to and was built by House Osgrey. The line of House Osgrey is carved into checkered squares in the stone above Coldmoat's gate and can be seen throughout the castle. However, in some places it has been replaced by Weber iconography. The key difference is the Weber iconography looks fairly new, but the Osgreys has borne down by the elements over the centuries. Within Coldmoat's yard are kennels, stables, a smithy, and a seven-sided wooden step with windows of leaded glass. The audience chamber of the Webbers is decorated with tapestries of battles and tourneys, and the stone floors are carved with rushes. Cold Moat also contains a maester's tower. The castle can support 20 times as many small folk as Stanfast, the nearby holding of House Osgrey. The landscape near Cold Moat contains fields of barley, wheat and corn, as well as six orchards of apples, apricots and pears. The Webbers are proud of their horse breeding as well, have become very well known for it, with Weber horses held in high regard by knights and lords across Westeros and even the eastern parts of Essos. Much of the early history of House Weber is not yet known, but we do know a lot more about their recent history after they took possession of Cold Moat and the former Osgrey lands. We know a Lord Renyard Weber once ruled Cold Moat during the time of Sir Eustace Osgrey's father. He was presumably followed by Lord Wyman Weber, who was among those fighting in the Battle of the Red Grass Field, staying loyal to House Targaryen and King Daron II. It was during that battle that Lord Wyman's daughter, Roanne's first husband, was killed. By the time of the second Duncan Egtel, Wyman had died, and his daughter, Roanne, was now Lady of Coldmoat. By far the most interesting member of House Weber is Lady Roanne Weber herself, who does play a vital role in the second Duncan Egg story, The Sworn Sword. She would become known to lords and commons alike as the Red Widow, given how many times she was widowed over her life, and her famous red hair. She was Lady of Coldmoat and head of House Weber during the reign of King Ares I Targaryen. It is made clear in the text that Lady Roanne was very short, approximately 4 feet 11, slim, and had strawberry blonde red hair and grey green eyes. She had a dimpled chin, a snub nose, and freckles. Rowan usually kept her hair bound in a braid that reached down to her thighs, and she frequently played with it while entertaining her guests in her hall. Rowan tried to appear ferocious to other lords and knights, and gained a fierce reputation within the reach and the local area as a result. She enjoyed archery and was said to be very talented at it. During her childhood, Rowan was said to be fond of the young Adam Osgrey, who served as her father, Wyman's page, and later squire at Coldmoat. He was the son of Sir Eustace Osgrey, whose family lands House Weber now controlled. The two had an innocent romance, though it is said that they supposedly never went past a few kisses. Because of this relationship, Adam's father, Sir Eustace Osgrey, proposed that they marry, making both Adam and Rowan happy, and settling the lingering land dispute between the two families. But Lord Wyman refused him. Instead, Rowan was married to a different squire of her father's. During the first Blackfire Rebellion, her father and her husband fought in the Battle of the Red Grass Field in 196 AC on the side of House Targaryen, while Adam and House Osgrey fought on the side of the Blackfires. Rowan's husband, 12 years old at the time, was slain in battle, and she became a widow for the first time at the age of 10. Adam also died during the battle, which caused a deep-rooted resentment and grudge against Sir Eustace by Rowan. At the age of 13, Rowan was married again to a 54-year-old man, who soon after their marriage died of a chill. Six months after his death, she gave birth to their son, who was weak and died within three days. Her third husband, Sir Simon Staunton, choked to death on a chicken bone, while her fourth husband, Sir Rollard Uffering, died during the Great Spring Sickness. Rowan did bear a daughter by either her third or fourth husband, but the girl did not live a year, and it said the death of her daughter caused Rowan great sorrow. 
Because of the unfortunate deaths of her husbands and children, Rowan gained the name the Red Widow, given the red spider on House Weber's banner and the amount of times a woman so young had been widowed. And of course, her striking red hair. The small folk accused her of poisoning her husbands and being a witch who sold her unborn babies to the Lord of the Seven Hells. Before his death, Lord Wyman attempted to marry Rowan to his Castilian, Sir Lucas Itchfield, but she refused him. As such, Wyman stated in his will that Rowan had two years to marry after his death and that if she would remain unwed, Coldmoat and all its attached lands and wealth would be granted to her cousin, Sir Wendell Webber. On his deathbed, Rowan's father charged Lucas to scare off unworthy suitors, though in the two years that would follow, Lucas would attempt to scare off all travellers to Coldmoat. Lucas's behaviour, in addition to the rumours concerning the deaths of Rowan's four husbands and the two children who had died, caused the number of suitors to be much lower than would have been expected based on her beauty and status. But she did still have several suitors. Among them were Clayton Caswell and Simon Laygood both rather persistent, and Sir Gerald Lannister, the younger brother to Lord of Casterly Rock, who sent her flattering letters from Casterly Rock, but whom Rowan did not believe to be willing to leave the Westerlands and his position at his brother's seat. Lady Rowan continued to rule Coldmoat into 211 AC, the setting of the second Duncan Egg short story, the Swan Sword. By this time, she only had until the new moon to marry, in order to keep her seat and lands, which looked as if they'd be passing to her cousin. When her small folk built a small dam on the Checky Water, a nearby river, Sir Benis of the Brown Shield, working for Eustace Osgray, assaulted one of her workers. Sir Duncan the Tall, the renowned hedge knight and future legendary commander of the King's Guard of Aegon V, came to Coldmoat on behalf of Eustace Osgray to pay the blood price. But Rowan rejected this offer. Lady Rowan brought a small force to the Checky Water, where she was confronted by Duncan, Eustace, and Duncan's squire Egg, who was secretly Prince Aegon Targaryen, later King Aegon V. She accepted a trial by battle, choosing Sir Lucas Itchfield as her champion to fight Eustace's champion, Duncan. Lucas Itchfield was killed in the trial, however, and the valour of Duncan reconciled Eustace and Rowan. Rowan visited Adam Osgray's grave at Stamfast, and when she began to weep, Eustace comforted her. They married the next day, allowing Rowan to keep Coldmoat. Many in the Reach viewed this marriage as simply a political move by allowing Rowan to keep her position and Eustace to return to his ancestral home of Coldmoat, while also ending the dispute over the water supply. During Duncan the Tall's attempts to defuse the feud between Eustace and Rowan, both developed a certain affection towards each other. When Duncan woke up after nearly being killed in the trial by combat and found Rowan had married Eustace and that she had never visited him while recovering, Duncan was said to have felt rejected. On the day he left Coldmoat, Rowan tried to offer Duncan a place as a captain of her guard, but he refused the offer. She then offered him one of her famous horses to give him something to remember her by, but Duncan refused this as well. At the conclusion of their argument, they kissed passionately, and Duncan cut off her famous braid to keep to remember her by. However, she did also gift a young palfrey to Duncan's young squire, Egg, which he went on to eventually name Rain. After the death of Sir Eustace Osgray, sometime between 211 and 219 AC, Rowan went on to marry Lord Gerald Lannister, who was one of her primary suitors before the events of the Swan Sword. By this time, after the death of his brother, Gerald was now the Lord of Castle Rock. The two had four sons, twins, Tywald and Tion, Titus and Jason Lannister. This would mean that Rowan was the grandmother of Lord Tywin, Sir Kevin, Girion, Sir Tygert, Lady Jenna, Lady Joanna, Sir Stefford and Damon Lannister, and thus the great-grandmother of Jaime Lannister, Cersei Lannister and Tyrion Lannister. Lady Rowan disappeared under the very mysterious circumstances in 230 AC, less than a year after giving birth to Jason. There is no indication of her fate or what truly happened to her. Some suspect she died, some that she was killed, others that she ran away, maybe to be with some secret lover. The final fate of House Webber is not yet known, and it's not clear who Rowan's lands passed to, either after she married Lord Gerald, or after her disappearance. It is possible they may have passed to a distant Webber cousin, perhaps Wendell Webber, or his descendants. It's even possible Colmelt is now under the control of a different house altogether. What we do know is a sellsword with the wind blown, who is decorated with spider tattoos, much like that of the banner of House Webber, is said to nurse a claim to lost lands in Westeros. It is speculated that this could refer 
to House Weber and Coldmoat. When looking at the history of Westeros since Aegon's conquest over its near 300 years, it's easy to view the death of the dragons of House Targaryen as happening very quickly. The way the Dance of the Dragons looks in a wider context of the timeline makes you view the war as a singular event marked by the end of the era of dragons in Westeros. But when you focus on that time period just after the Dance of the Dragons, the death of dragons is not just a singular event, but something that happens slowly over time. Yes, most of the adult dragons were killed over the course of the Dance of the Dragons, and several in the destruction of the dragon pit near the end of the war. But the reality is, it took several more years to possibly decades for the last dragons to fade into the pages of history. Plus, there are of course the weak and frail dragons that were hatched in the aftermath of the dance. In terms of the adult dragons, we know of the two wild dragons that were still active in the years after the dance, with Cannibal going missing after the war and Sheepstealer suspected to be hiding somewhere with her dragon seed rider in the mountain of the Vale. You also have the dragon of Raina Targaryen, Morning whose current fate is as of yet unknown. So while the Dance of the Dragons marked the beginning of the end for dragons in Westeros, we don't really know for sure how long it took for the last dragon to die. The Reach during the Dance of the Dragons played a huge role in the conflict, owing to the fact that House Hightower made up with such a key part of the Greens, and thus they controlled Old Town. And while House Tyrell remained neutral, many of the Reach Lords did side with the Hightowers. While the Riverlands did become the site for many of the key bloody battles during the war, when you take a look back at history, the Reach was just as rabid and bathed in blood as the Riverlands. Perhaps two of the bloodiest battles in the war happened at the town of Tumbleton in the Reach, with the Second Battle of Tumbleton being perhaps the single bloodiest battle involving dragons since the Doom of Valyria, with a total of four adult dragons being part of it, albeit three of those four ended up being riderless for most of the battle which in turn added to the sheer chaos that makes the Second Battle of Tumbleton one of the most horrific battles of the Dance of the Dragons. Out of the four dragons to take part in the battle, Vermithor, Tissarion, Sea Smoke and Silverwing, only Silverwing would survive the battle. Silverwing was the beloved dragon of good Queen Alisande, with whom she had a very strong bond with. She was hatched in 36 AC when Alisande's older sister, Reyna, placed a dragon's egg in her cradle with the egg soon hatching. Interestingly, it seems to be Reyna who started the tradition of Targaryen babies having dragon eggs placed in their cradles soon after birth. She did this with both of her younger siblings, Jaehaerys and Alysanne, with these eggs hatching into Vermithor and Silverwing. Now during the Dance of the Dragons, Silverwing was claimed by the dragon seed, Ulf White, on behalf of Rhaenyra Targaryen and the Blacks until Ulf swapped sides to the Greens just before Tumbleton. The aftermath of the second battle Silverwing was the only one of the four dragons to survive. It is impossible to know the mind of a dragon and how they perceive the world. Do they feel lost like a person would? Do they mourn the loss of their riders? Do they mourn the loss of their brothers and sisters? This question came to the forefront during the aftermath of the second Tumbleton in the ravished fields of the Reach as Silverwing began to display behaviour that had not been documented before in terms of dragon behaviour, with some maces arguing Silverwing's actions were not only out of character for dragons, but also Silverwing herself. It is said that as the battle began to wind down, Silverwing avoided much of the conflict and instead circled the battlefield for hours aimlessly, roaring her sorrowful roar. She only stopped her circling and descended again the next day, after the sun had gone down and the crows had began to gather, landing between the slain dragons of Vermithor, Sea Smoke, and Tessarian. The singers and some eyewitnesses' accounts claim that Silverwing had attempted to lift Vermithor's wing on three occasions roaring with sorrow each time his wing fell back into the mud. While Archmace de Gildane considers this most likely to have been a fable to dramatise the aftermath of the battle, but some more marginalised maesters point towards Septon Bath's work on the biology of dragons and suggest that Silverwing was mourning Vermithor. There is some evidence that support this possibility, namely that if Silverwing did possess the capacity to mourn, it would make sense for her to mourn Vermithor. The two dragons were that of King Jaehaerys and good Queen Alisanne. It is suggested the connection the king and queen shared could also have impacted and imprinted on their dragons. Needless to say, when the sun rose again the next morning, Silverwing began to fly listlessly across the fields where she fed on the burned carcasses of men and animals for the next few days. As the Greens and the Hightower forces began to regroup in the smoking ruins of Tumbleton, Lord Unwin Peak, now in command of the army, offered a thousand gold dragons to any knight of noble birth able to claim Silverwing. Out of the three men who came forth, the first had his arm torn off, the second burned to death, 
The third man then changed his mind as a result, and Silverwing remained unclaimed. Silverwing was only one of four dragons still alive at the end of the Dance of the Dragons. Although accustomed to men and civilization, Silverwing, after leaving the ruins of Tumbleton, went missing and could not be traced for several years. It is said that she became a wild dragon during the regency period of King Aegon III of Targaryen, on a small island with a cave in Red Lake in the northwest of the Reach. By 136 AC, we know that she was still living in the Reach, on her small island in Red Lake. When plans were being made for King Aegon III's royal progress across the whole of Westeros, given the king's great dislike and fear of dragons, Red Lake would need be avoided and given a wide berth. As of right now, we do not know the final fate of Silverwing, as she seems to fade into the pages of history after 136 AC. Some say she left Westeros and headed east across the narrow sea to Essos, perhaps returning to her ancestral home of Valyria, while others suggest she could have flown out west across the Sunset Sea, never to return. Just as likely is that Silverwing remained at Red Lake for the rest of her days before dying of old age sometime in the decades after the Dance of the Dragons. But all of these ideas are pure speculation, and unless further information is discovered, we may never know the true final fate of Silverwing, the dragon of Red Lake, who made her home in the Reach after the horrific bloodshed of both battles of Tumbleton. House Oakheart are a powerful old family from Old Oak in the Reach, and one of the largest houses sworn to House Tyrell of Highgarden. They are also counted among the noble houses of the Reach, as they can trace their descent from Garth Greenhand. The coat of arms are three gold oak leaves on a gold background. According to some sources, their motto is, Our roots go deep. Like many of the old houses of the Reach, House Oakheart are of first men origin and can claim descent from John the Oak, a legendary son of Garth Greenhand, sired on a giantess. As a result, John was a huge man, said to be 8 feet tall, and in some tales, even 10 or 12 feet. John the Oak was also credited as being the person to bring the concept of chivalry to the Reach, and as a result, the whole of Westeros. Like most of Garth Greenhand's offspring, John the Oak would have several children, whom his descendants eventually became House Oakheart. At some point in their history, during the period of the Hundred Kingdoms, House Oakheart were petty kings with a small kingdom themselves. The petty kings of Old Oak eventually, like most petty kings in the Reach, joined the realm of the Gardner kings, specifically King Garth III Gardner, King of the Reach, through a pact of friendship and mutual defence. This is speculated to be as a result of regular attacks in their lands by House Lannister, whom were at the time Kings of the Rock. Lancelot I Lannister, King of the Rock, once conquered the Kingdom of the Reach as far south as Old Oak, before he fell in battle. With the backing of Highgarden, defending the Reach would be much more effective, and Old Oak much more secure than before. During Aegon's conquest of Westeros, Lord Oakheart led King Mern the Ninth Gardener's left flank at the Field of Fire, where all the male gardeners burned and their line ended. As a result, House Tyrell became Aegon's new Wardens of the South and Lords of Highgarden, and thus House Oakheart's new Liege Lords. This was a controversial choice in the Reach for a lot of the old houses, the Oakhearts boasting an older and more distinguished lineage than the Tyrells, as well as a closer blood tie to House Gardener, something that House Tyrell lacked entirely. While they were very unhappy about having to pledge loyalty to the Tyrells, they rightly understood that they could not defy Aegon's choice, given his power and his three dragons. Over time, as tempers cooled, House Oakheart became big supporters of their new king. The Oakhearts had the honour of hosting Aegon the Conqueror and his court many times at Old Oak during the numerous rural progresses across his realm, something not many houses could boast. In 12 AC, during the First Dornish War, Sir John Catherine was to marry Alice Oakheart, daughter of the Lord of Old Oak. At the wedding, the notorious Will of Will led attackers that slew Lord Oakheart and most of the guests at the wedding. This caused much outrage across the Reach, especially as Lady Alice and her handmaidens were carried off and sold to mirish slavers. The actions of Will of Will are still infamous at Old Oak, and thus House Oakheart holds a deep mistrust and dislike of the Dornish even into the Baratheon era of Westeros, when Nymor Mytel, Prince of Dawn, sent his daughter, Daria, as an envoy to King's Landing in 13 AC. King Aegon rejected Lord Oakheart's suggestion to send her to the meanest brothels of King's Landing. During the reign of King Maegor Targaryen, Lord Torgon Oakheart was amongst the Reach Lords to support Septim Moon in the Faith Militant Uprising. When Maegor died in 48 AC, Septim Moon was camped outside the walls of Old Town, and Lord Oakheart, among many other lords that had joined him. Lord Donald Hightower was reluctant to offer battle to the lords protecting Septon Moon, 
or Torgan Oakheart was likewise reluctant to commit the host to assaulting Old Town in a hopeless attack that would likely see huge losses. When Moon was assassinated, Lord Torgan decamped the next day. Lord Torgan later attended the wedding of Rogar Baratheon and Alyssa Valarian, where he had met King Jaehaerys I, pronouncing him grim. Later in 58 AC, Sir Ryan Redwine unhorsed Sir Arthur Oakheart at a tourney in King's Landing, with Lord Torgan attending the grand feast that followed. In 73 AC, a Lord Oakheart held a tourney to celebrate the birth of a son. During this tourney, Prince Balon Targaryen, one of the sons, King Jaehaerys, on horse Sir Denis, heir to Old Oak, with the prince only being 16 years of age at the time, being knighted for his valour during the tourney. When Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen toured the south in 112 AC, the son of Lord Oakheart unsuccessfully attempted to court the princess. Later, when the Dance of the Dragons broke out, House Oakheart would side with Princess Rhaenyra and the Blacks, despite the earlier rejection. However, Prince Daron the Daring and Lord Ormond Hightower forced the submission of House Oakheart at Old Oak, as no one dared face the prince's dragon Tessarion. In the later area of Targaryen Westeros, Sir Oliver the Green Oak served in the Kingsguard of the young dragon, King Daron I Targaryen, during his conquest of Dawn. Sir Oliver died alongside his king at the hand of the Dornish assassins in 161 AC, having been treacherously ambushed under a peace banner. During the first Blackfyre Rebellion, in 196 AC, House Oakheart tried to keep one foot in each camp during the fighting, choosing no side, much to the dislike of supporters of both the Targaryen loyalists and the Blackfires. By the time of the Baratheon era of Westeros, in 290 AC, Sir Aerys Oakheart serves the Iron Throne as Kingsguard for Robert Baratheon. After Robert's death, Aerys continued to serve his son, King Joffrey, during the outbreak of the War of the Five Kings. Aerys's mother, Lady Arwen, followed Lord Mace Tyrell in raising their banner for Renly Baratheon and was an active part of his war councils. However, Sir Aerys Oakheart remained loyal to the crown during this time. It is noted that Sir Aerys objected to when King Joffrey ordered him to hit Sansa Stark in front of the whole court. Although he eventually does strike Sansa Stark, it was noted that Aerys did not hit the girl hard and shortly after this incident is sent to Dawn with Princess Marcella Baratheon as her sworn shield. After the death of Renly Baratheon, the Oakharks follow the Tyrells in their alliance with House Lannister and House Baratheon of King's Landing. After the Battle of the Blackwater, Lady Oakheart is rewarded with some lesser tracts of land, though she is not present at King's Landing during this time. While in Dawn protecting the Princess Marcella, Sir Eris is seduced by Princess Ariane Martell and conspires with her to crown Princess Marcella as Queen. He is later killed by Aero Hota when discovered at Greenblood, preferring death to the disgrace of forsaking his Kingsguard. House Rowan of Golden Grove is one of the most prominent and oldest families from the Reach. They are in a special position within the Reach, as its dominion extends all along its whole northern borders with the Westerlands, meaning they have traditionally been the first line of defence from attacks from the Kings of the Rock, House Lannister. At some point, this resulted in House Rowan being made Marshals of the North March to replace the declining House Osgrey, whom are now their bannermen. Their banner is a golden tree on a silver background, and as of a dance with dragons, their house words are unknown. Like several other major houses from the Reach, the Rowans can trace their descent from the legendary Garth Greenhand to his daughter, Rowan Golden Tree. According to legend, she was so bereft when her lover left her for her rich rival, she wrapped an apple in her golden hair and planted it upon a hill. From that very apple grew a tree whose bark, leaves and fruit were yellow gold. House Rowan traces its roots to Rowan's daughters. In some legends of the Reach, Lan the Clever was a bastard born to Rowan, or potentially her sister, Floris the Fox. During Aegon Targaryen's conquest of Westeros, House Rowan's seat of Golden Grove was chosen as the rallying point of the armies of King of the Rock, Lauren the First Lannister, and the King of the Reach, Merlin the Ninth Gardener. With Golden Grove seen as a good centre point to meet between the two kingdoms, the Rowans were a large part of the 55,000 strong host assembled by the two kings to face the coming invaders, and thus played a large role in the Field of Fire, which saw the end of House Gardener and the lowering of House Lannister from kings to Lord Paramount of the Westerlands. It is said House Rowan suffered large losses during the battle, given their high position in the army of King Mern. During 48 AC, during the reign of Maegor the Cruel, Lord Rickard Rowan, alongside other Reach Lords, marched alongside Septon Moon against King Maegor at the end of the Faith Militant Uprising. 
Lord Rickard Rowan, alongside Torgan Oakheart, were among the most prominent lords to join the faith militant at this time. The two lords protected the Septon and his followers when they camped beneath the walls of Old Town. Lord Donald Hightower refused to take up arms against Moon's followers, with many claiming the real reason was not wishing to offer battle to Lord Rowan and Lord Oakheart. They remained with Moon until his assassination, at which point they struck their banners. House Rowan was one of the very few houses of the Reach to declare for the Blacks and Queen Rhaenyra during the Targaryen Civil War, known as the Dance of the Dragons. Many assumed they would side with the Greens and King Aegon II, given their connection to House Hightower and Old Town. Their biggest involvement was fighting in the Battle on the Honeywine. The Lord of the House during this time, Lord Thaddeus Rowan, later became a regent and Hand of the King during the reign of King Aegon III, but after the war had ended a role in which he served loyally to the boy king. However, he was caught up in a plot to assassinate King Aegon and replace him with his brother, Prince Viserys. As a result, Rowan was held in captivity for weeks and brutally tortured. When the plot finally came to light and the truth was exposed, Lord Rowan was released from his captivity with the real conspirators admitting to framing Rowan's involvement to hide their own part in the plot. Despite his innocence being discovered, Lord Thaddeus Rowan was a broken and damaged man and died shortly after his release from the dungeons. House Rowan played a minor role during the rest of the Targaryen era after the Dance of the Dragons. The Lord of Golden Grove was the liege lord of Sir Eustace Osgrey and Lady Rowan Webber, who play a large role in the second Duncan Egg story, The Sworn Sword, with Lord Rowan being distantly related to Lady Rowan as one of his sisters married Rowan's father, Wendell. We also know daughter of Lord Rowan, was betrothed to Sir Tion Lannister, the second son of Lord Gerald Lannister and Lady Rowan Webber. This was until Tion was seduced and persuaded by Lady Ellen Rain to marry her instead, breaking his betrothal with House Rowan. Again, House Rowan plays a minor supporting role in the main book series, during the Baratheon era of Westeros. In a Game of Thrones, a Night's Watchman was an apprentice singer in the Reach, before being caught in bed with the daughter of Lord Mathis Rowan of Goldengrove. Though Daron maintains that she was waiting for him naked and helped him into her room, under her father's eyes she named it Rape. For this, Daron was sent to the wall. During a clash of kings, Lord Mathis Rowan sides with King Renly Baratheon during the War of Five Kings, in large part following the support of the liege lord's House Tyrell. Later, after the death of Renly, House Rowan joins the Tyrells in their new alliance with House Lannister and House Baratheon of King's Landing and as a result, were a large part of the Battle of the Blackwater. Lord Mathis was among the lords presented to King Joffrey at the awarding ceremony after the battle, with the new hand of the king, Lord Tymon Lannister, granting him an advisory seat on the Swall Council as a reward for his service. During a storm of swords, after the feast of the wedding of Tyrion Lannister to Sansa Stark, Lord Mathis Rowan is noted to have danced with Sansa. Later, during the wedding of Joffrey Baratheon to Marjorie Tyrell, Lord Mathis gives Joffrey a red silk pavilion as a wedding gift. During the wedding feast, a man sworn to House Rowan stabs a Dornishman, and in the aftermath of the assassination of Joffrey, an archer that was said to be in Rowan livery tells Sir Jamie Lannister that Sansa Stark was the one who killed Joffrey. Finally, during a feast for crows, Sir Kevin Lannister named Lord Mathis a good candidate to fill the vacant position of Hand of the King during his meeting with Queen Cersei. The Queen instead revoked Mathis Rowan's honorary council seat altogether. Lord Rowan, though outraged at his dismissal, still attends the wedding of King Tommen and Marjorie Tyrell, and later is part of the force that marches with Lord Mace Tyrell to lay siege to Storm's End. And as of a dance with dragons, that's all we know of House Rowan. House Florent, who hail from Brightwater Keep, is a noble house from the Reach, and one of the main houses sworn to House Tyrell of Highgarden. Their sigil is a red gold fox's head, encircled by blue flowers, like many of the oldest houses in the Reach. They claim the descent from Garth Greenhand by his daughter, Floris the Fox. She was said to be the cleverest of his many children. According to myth, she kept three husbands each ignorant of the existence of the other two. Her sons became the founders of House Florent, House Ball, and House Peak. In some tales of the Reach, Lan the Clever was a bastard born of Floris, or perhaps of her sister, Rowan Goldentree. The sister changes depending on the house telling the story. Due to their close blood ties to the extinct Kings of the Reach House Gardener, they technically have a much better claim to High Garden than its current lords, House Tyrell. During Aegon Targaryen's conquest of Westeros, 
House Florent followed their liege lords and kin, King Mern the Ninth Gardener, in taking up arms against Aegon the Conqueror during the battle that became known as the Field of Fire. After the battle, when King Mern and his sons burned and the Gardener's line ended, Aegon named House Tyrell as Lord Paramount of the Reach. Despite the Florence possessing a superior claim by their blood ties to the kings of the Reach, however, in truth, half the houses in the Reach had some kind of blood tie to House Gardener. House Florent was among the greatest houses of the Reach that bitterly complained about being made vassals of the Tyrells and insisted that their blood was nobler than that of the upjump stewards. Their protests were denied again and again by King Aegon I, and once it became clear his decision was final, it was never heard again under any of his descendants. Perhaps because the Florents had fought House Targaryen when the Tyrells did not, is why they were not given High Garden. During the Regency period of King Aegon III, after the Dance of the Dragons in 133 AC, Lord Unwin Peak, who was the king's hand and protector of the realm, sought to make his daughter Marielle the queen to King Aegon III, leading to the Maiden Days Ball, intended for the king to choose his new bride. Lady Samantha Hightower nominated maidens from House Florent, among other noble houses, as potential queen consort for the king. Later, in 206 AC, during the reign of Daron II Targaryen, Sir Arlen of Pennytree and his squire Duncan, later Sir Duncan the Tall, were in service to a Lord Florent for a while, who was said to be blind. The Florent arms were spotted by Sir Duncan in the assembled heraldry at the Tawny and Ashford Meadows three years later, where Sir Alador Florent, heir to Brightwater Keep, and Sir John Florent were listed on the rolls of the Tawny. During the Baratheon era of Westeros, Selyse Florent, a member of House Florent, is married to Stannis Baratheon, Lord of Dragonstone, and the brother to King Robert I Baratheon. It is said that her cousin, Delaina Florent, was despoiled by the king during the wedding feast of Selyse and Stannis, something that both House Florent and Stannis took as a great insult. Lord Tywin Lannister offered his dwarf son, Tyrion, for marriage to Delaina, but her father, Sir Colin Florent, instead married her to one of his knights, Hoseman Norcross. Delaina gave birth to a boy named Edric Storm, who grew up at Storm's End under the care of Renly Baratheon. Sir Axel Florent, the brother of Lord Alistair Florent of Brightwater Keep, serves Stannis as Castilian of Dragonstone after the War of Five Kings begins. During the second A Song of Ice and Fire novel, A Clash of Kings, Melisandre, the Red Priestess, has joined the court of Stannis Baratheon on Dragonstone, with Lady Selyse Florent fervently taking up the worship of Raelor, the Lord of Light. With his attention from Selyse, raising Melisandre's position greatly. Once the War of Five Kings breaks out in earnest, and Stannis is seen by many as the rightful king of Westeros, Selyse Florent becomes Stannis' queen. However, the support of House Florent to Stannis' cause was far from given, with the main branch of House Florent following their liege lords of House Tyrell in support for the late king, Robert Baratheon's youngest brother, Renly, Lord of Storm's End, who had also crowned himself king. The Florents fielded roughly 2,000 men and was seen as a huge loss for Stannis. Upon Renly Baratheon's death at Storm's End, the Florents are the first and most powerful of the Reach Houses to then defect to Stannis rather than follow House Tyrell into its new alliance with House Lannister. Selyse's uncle, Lord Alistair Florent, begins following Raelor as the religion begins to take hold a lot deeper across Stannis' camp following the death of Renly. Alistair's nephew, Sir Erin, is one of the knights Stannis sends to recruit Renly's infantry at Bitterbridge, but they do not return. Alistair's son-in-law, Lord Randall Tarly, puts many Florent men-at-arms to death when he seizes Renly's stores to ensure they do not go over to Stannis' side. Lord Alistair is with Stannis during the parley with Sir Courtney Penrose, who refuses to yield Storm's End or his ward, Edric Storm, the bastard son of Delaina Florent and King Robert Baratheon. Edric is later sent to Dragonstone after Courtney's death and the fall of Storm's End. Selyse's brother, Sir Imre Florent, is given command of Stannis' royal fleet in the Battle of the Blackwater. He relies on the size of his fleet and does not send scouts ahead. Almost his entire force is trapped in the Blackwater Rush by Tyrion Lannister's defensive chain and is destroyed by wildfire. He dies on fury along with most of his men. Despite the spirited defences of King's Landing, Stannis' army seems within sight of victory. However, the Florence rivals, the Tyrells, arrive with Lord Tywin Lannister from the south of the Blackwater. 
and routs Stannis' men. During the third book, A Storm of Swords, most of Stannis' men were rescued from the shorelines of the Lysini fleet of Salador San, where badges of Brightwater Keep and House Florent, and by the time they are regrouping on Dragonstone, it is estimated more than half of Stannis' men of Florence, with Lord Alistair Florent becoming his Hand of the King. The War with House Tyrell brings up the old issues of Highgarden. Lord Tywin, the Hand of the King for Joffrey I Baratheon, dispossesses the Florence of their holdings and awards them to Sir Garland Tyrell, the second son of Mace Tyrell, Lord Paramount of the Reach, as a reward for loyal service, forming House Tyrell of Brightwater Keep, thus technically making House Florent landless. When Alistair plots to wed Stannis' daughter, Princess Shireen Baratheon, to Joffrey's brother, Prince Tommen Baratheon. In an effort to make peace without Stannis' knowledge, he is thrown in the dungeons. Axel counsels Stannis to put Claw Isle to the torch in retaliation for Lord Arden Kaltegar bending the knee, but Stannis dismisses the idea, agreeing with Davos that this is an evil notion, and thus Davos becomes Alistair's successor as Hand of the King. Davos arranges for Edric Storm to be sent to Lys to avoid being burned alive by Melisandre. Later in the story, after Stannis' eyes turn north, during the battle beneath the wall, Jon Snow spots a ring of flowers amongst the banners when Stannis' hosts attack the Free Folk camp. The banners of House Florent are later spotted flying at Castle Black as well by Samuel Tarly during the fifth book, A Dance with Dragons. Lord Davos Seaworth recalls that when Stannis Baratheon sailed for the wall, Melisandre burned Lord Alistair Florent alive to obtain favourable winds for the voyage. Once Stannis arrived in the north, he left Sir Axel Florent with Queen Selyse Florent and some fellow men-at-arms at Eastwatch by the sea. Axel at this point begins calling himself the Queen's Hand, behind Stannis' back. Selyse and Axel later stop at Castle Black on their way to the Night Fort. Axel hopes to meet the beautiful Val, a wildling princess, who is staying at Castle Black under the protection of the Night's Watch. While at Castle Black, the Queen arranges many marriages between her men and the men of the Free Folk, betrothing Axel to the eldest daughter of Garrick Kingsblood. As of the end of A Dance with Dragons, that is all we know of House Florent for now. House Fossaway of Cider Hall is a noble house and one of the principal bannermen sworn to House Tyrell of Highgarden. Their seat of Cider Hall is located at the fork of the River Manda, given to strong strategic position. The banner is a red apple over a golden field, with the words being a taste of glory. House Fossaway has one of the most prominent cadet branches of a house in Westeros. Therefore, the main branch of the house is commonly referred to as the Red Apple Fossaways, and their cadet branch, the Green Apples. Their cadet branch has its seat at New Barrel, and is considered a knightly house rather than a lordly one. House Fossaway is one of the oldest noble houses in the Reach, being able to trace their descent back to First Men origins during the Age of Heroes. The Fossaways claim descent from Foss the Archer, one of the many children of Garth Greenhand, renowned for shooting apples off the head of any maid that took his fancy. This story is where the house takes the iconography in its banner from. During the early reign of King Jaehaerys I Targaryen, Lord Martin Tyrell was married to a lady Florence Fossaway, who increased House Tyrell's income by a third, a significant amount. When Lord Martin later was asked to serve as Master of Coin on the small council for Jaehaerys, it was his clever wife, Lady Florence, who performed most of his duties. While officially Lord Martin was the master of coin, behind closed doors, everybody knew it was his wife who fulfilled much of the duties of the role. During the Dance of the Dragons, the bloody Targaryen Civil War of Succession, House Fossaway supported King Aegon II Targaryen and his Green Faction. Owen Fossaway, Lord of Cider Hall, was a member of the Bloody Caltrops, a group of conspirators that wanted the dragon seeds of White and Hard Hugh Hammer dead, in between the first and second battles of Tumbleton. Owen was then later killed at the second battle of Tumbleton, ending House Fossaway's role in the Dance of the Dragons. The red apple of House Fossaway was spotted by Sir Duncan the Tall among the heraldry on display at Ashford in 209 AC. Sir Stephen Fossaway and his cousin, Raymond, both attended a tourney at Ashford Meadow, with Stephen intending to enter the lists. Raymond served as his squire until Sir Duncan the Tall's trial of seven. After promising Sir Duncan to take his side, Stephen revealed his intention to join Prince Makar Targaryen and the accusers instead. Stephen justified himself to his cousin Raymond by alleging that he would be Lord Fossaway at the end of the day. Raymond instead supported Sir Duncan 
and to differentiate himself on the field of battle against Stefan, Sir Ryman, newly knighted by Sir Lionel Baratheon, repainted the red Fossaway apple blazoning his shield green, thus in turn founding House Fossaway of New Barrel, who would become the largest cadet branch of the main house. For now, that is all the information we have about House Fossaway during the Targaryen era of Westeros. The next prominent role in history comes well into the Baratheon era during the War of Five Kings, specifically in the second book, A Clash of Kings. The banners of the Red Apple Fossaways are spotted beneath the walls of Bitterbridge during the feast with Renly Baratheon's army, which Catelyn Tully attended at Bitterbridge. Sir Tanton Fossaway climbed on the table and swears to slay Sandor Clegane in single combat. Later on, during the parley between Renly and Stannis Baratheon, Renly boasts to his brother about having the support of House Fossaway, which demonstrates how much of an asset the house is to the war effort. Both branches of House Fossaway later turn to Stannis after Renly's death, choosing not to follow House Tyrell in their new alliance with House Lannister and House Baratheon of King's Landing. Sir Courtney Penrose acknowledges Sir John of the Green Apple and Sir Brian of the Red during his parley with Stannis. Later on, during Stannis' siege of Storm's End, Courtney's lieutenant is Lord Elwood Meadow, a cousin to the Fossaways, who immediately surrenders the castle to them after Courtney's death. The red apple of the Fossaways of Cider Hall is spotted among the banner in the vanguard of Stannis' army, led by Sir Gaillard Morrigan, as it approaches King's Landing. During the ensuing Battle of the Blackwater, Lothar Brune manages to cut his way through half a hundred Fossaway men at arms to capture Sir John from the Green Apple Branch and slay Sir Brian and Sir Edward of the Red Apple Branch, earning him the name Lothar the Apple Eater. After the battle, both branches of House Fossaway bend the knee to King Joffrey I Baratheon. During the third book, A Storm of Swords, in the aftermath of the War of Five Kings, Lady Leonette Fossaway accompanies her husband, Sir Garland Tyrell, to court in King's Landing. For his valour during the Battle of the Blackwater, Sir Garland is granted the lands, titles and incomes of Brightwater Keep, the former seat of House Florent, who at this time were still allied with Stannis Baratheon, with Stannis' queen Selyse being a member of the house, technically making Leonette the new Lady of Brightwater Keep. Lady Leonette would often accompany Lady Marjorie Tyrell as part of her retinue during her time in King's Landing. Later on at the royal wedding of King Joffrey and Lady Marjorie, Tyrion Lannister observes a Fossaway and his pregnant wife. And much later during the events in A Feast for Crows, Brianna Tarth spots the red apple badge of House Fossaway among those that have been collected from the dead after the battle at Duskendale. As of the fifth book, A Dance with Dragons, that is all we know about House Fossaway. Minor noble houses from the Reach, sworn to the high towers of Old Town. Despite their status as a minor house, they play an impactful role in the history of Westeros, specifically during the first half of the Targaryen era. Their seat is Honeyhold and is located next to the Honeywine River, which flows towards Old Town and the Whispering Sound. Their banner is three yellow beehives on a black pale over parley black and yellow field. While their house words do not appear in the main book series, according to semi-canon sources, they are, beware our sting. The bees breeze descend from the first men, unlike most of the noble houses of the Reach, claimed to have been founded by a child of Garth Greenhand, Ellen Eversweet. According to legends from wider sources and from House Beesbury itself, Ellen loved honey so much she sought out the king of the bees in his vast mountain hive and made a pact with him to care for his children and his children's children for all time, becoming the first beekeeper. The first major role House Beesbury plays in the history of Westeros is during the early part of the Targaryen era, specifically in the year 42 AC, during the faith militant uprising against King Aenys Targaryen and later his brother King Maegor the Cruel, reportedly taking the side of the faith. During King Maegor's legendary Trial of Seven, in which seven champions of the faith face King Maegor and his six champions in trial by combat, Sir Dickon Flowers, a bastard of House Breesbury, known as the Bastard of Beesbury, was one of the seven warrior sons to take part in the trial on behalf of the faith. Sir Dickon died during the fight. Later in the year 84 AC, during the reign of King Jaehaerys Targaryen, Sir Braxton Beesbury, the heir to Honeyholt, was a favourite of the king's willful and wild daughter, Princess Sarah Targaryen. After he and his retinue were embroiled in a scandal with the princess, having taken the princess's virtue, King Jaehaerys sentenced Braxton to a savage mutilation. 
However, as is his right as a knight, Sir Braxton was allowed to choose a trial by combat. But this was not to be a normal trial. Sir Braxton would represent himself. Usually in the case of a member of the royal family being the accuser, they are normally represented by a knight of the king's guard. But the king took Braxton's actions as a slight against his honour and chose to face the much younger man himself. Braxton was slain in a duel with Jaehaerys the following day. Lord Lyman Breesbury was the master of coin and a member of the small council during the reigns of Jaehaerys and King Viserys I Targaryen. When the Dance of the Dragons broke out after the death of Viserys in 129 AC, he was present at the Green Council in support of the claim of King Aegon II. However, when he voiced his support of the rights of Queen Rhaenyra, he was ultimately killed. How he was killed is debated. Some say he was arrested at Otto Hightower's command and sent to the Black Cells where he died of a chill, while others, that Sir Criston Cole, the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, either slit his throat with a knife or threw him from a window into the spite moat of Magor's Holdfast. Lyman's death was kept a secret, with most believing he was languishing in the Black Cells for much of the war. Lyman's heir, Sir Alan Beesbury, loudly demanded the release of his grandsire until he himself was captured in the battle on the Honeywine. A Lord Beesbury, Costain and Redwine were part of the escort of the High Septon of the Faith to King's Landing for the wedding of King Aegon III Targaryen and Queen Jehera Targaryen in 131 AC. After the Queen's death in 133 AC, Lady Samantha Tarly, who was the paramour of Lord Lionel Hightower and technically the Lady of the Hightower as well, due to being married to Lionel's late father, included a Beesbury among the maidens of the Reach, whom Aegon could marry when his Regency Council were looking for a new wife for the boy king, sending many of these maids to the Maiden Days Ball. During the tourney at Ashford Meadow in 209 AC, Sir Humphrey Beesbury splintered 12 lances against Sir Humphrey Harding in a match the small folk called the Battle of the Humphreys. Humphrey Beesbury who happened to be brother by marriage to Humphrey Harding, took part in the Trial of Seven on behalf of Sir Duncan the Tall. Humphrey Beesbury was slain in the first charge by Sir Donald of Duskendale from the Kingsguard. During the main book series, covering the Baratheon era of Westeros, House Beesbury plays a much more minor role in events. During the second book, A Clash of Kings, specifically during the events of the War of Vikings, King Renly Baratheon named House Beesbury as one of the Reach Houses supporting him during his parley with his brother, King Stannis Baratheon at Storm's End. During the events of A Storm of Swords, Sir Bertram Beesbury meets Jamie Lannister and Brianna Tarth at Brindlewood on the way back to King's Landing after leaving Harrenhal, giving them the news of the events of the Red Wedding. Later on, during a feast for crows, Brienne recalls that Sir Hugh Breesbury took part in the wager on her maidenhood, offering her as a present a pot of honey, as sweet as the maids of Tarth. This is all we currently know of House Beesbury. House Merryweather of Longtable is a noble but more minor house from the Reach. Their seat of Longtable is located at the confluence of the Manda and the Blueburn River, though they are seen as historically a prominent family of the Reach. But in more recent events, House Murrayweather has lost a lot of their land and wealth after Robert's Rebellion. Their banner is a golden horn of plenty, spilling out apples, carrots, plums, onions, leeks, turnips, and fruits of many colours, over a white field bordered in gold, with their motto being, Behold our bounty. Their seat of long table is located at the strong strategic position at the meeting of the Manda and Blueburn Rivers. In order to get to the large town of Bitterbridge, you have to pass through Long Table, meaning in a time of war, Long Table would often be the staging ground for many armies. Most of House Merriweather's history before Aegon the Conqueror's conquest of Westeros is not yet known, with the first detailed account of their history coming during the Targaryen eras of Westeros. In the year 43 AC, under the rule of King Magor, at the Battle Beneath the God's Eye, a Lord Merryweather was joined by the Lords Caswell and Peak in marching from the Reach to add their levies to that of King Magor Targaryen's host against Prince Aegon the Uncrowned. While Lords Merryweather and Caswell advanced against Aegon's host from the south, King Magor quickly killed his young nephew and the battle turned into a rout. Old Lord Merryweather was later killed the following year by the outlawed warrior's sons, who remained loyal to Sir Joffrey Doggett, who would later go on to join the Kingsguard of Magor's successor. 
King Jaehaerys Targaryen in the year 129 AC during the Targaryen Civil War of Succession that would become known as the Dance of the Dragons. Lord Meriwether was among the lords at court loyal to Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen for which he was imprisoned when her half-brother King Aegon II also claimed the throne. Lord Meriwether was brought before the king's justice and beheaded for refusing to bend the knee to King Aegon II staying loyal to Rhaenyra and the oath he had made 10 years prior. Later, during the height of the Civil War, Lord Ormond Hightower led a siege of Longtable, hoping to capture the Merryweather seat in order to allow a safe assault on Bitterbridge. When Lady Merryweather yielded the castle, Lord Hightower kept his word and did no harm, but stripped Longtable of all its wealth and food before marching on to Bitterbridge, the main target of the army. Later, during the First Battle of Tumbleton, Levies from Longtable joined the Black's host to fortify Tumbleton against the High Towers, with many losing their lives in the battle during the bloody regency period of King Aegon III Targaryen, starting in the year 131 AC. The young Jane Merriweather was considered a potential bride for the young king, believing her to be a rival to his own daughter, Marielle, Lord Unwin Peak, the Hand of the King and Lord Protector, had rumours spread that Jane dressed in a squire's garb to visit the brothels at King's Landing in an attempt to disparage the girl. The fact she was not chosen suggests his efforts might have been successful. Towards the end of the Regency, in 136 AC, Mark Merriweather was chosen by Lot in the Great Council to become a regent for King Aegon III. However, his time as a regent would turn out to be short-lived. Mark was well known for his love of feasts and was considered an inoffensive, though undistinguished, man to join the Council of Regents. When King Aegon III came of age later that year, he dismissed Mark from his office, much to his anger and displeasure, during the reign of the Mad King, Aerys Targaryen II. Between the years 226 and 283 AC, after Lord Tywin Lannister had resigned as Hand of the King, King Aerys raised Owen Merriweather, to the office. Owen would become known as the Horn of Plenty Hand, owing to House Merryweather's sigil. When tensions grew between Aerys and his heir, Prince Rhaegar Targaryen, it fell to Lord Owen and Grand Maester Pycelle to try and keep the peace between their supporters, something that would ultimately be easier said than done. Aerys II later stripped the Merryweathers of their lands and exiled Lord Owen 282 AC for his failures as Hand to prevent Robert's rebellion. However, in reality, there was very little Lord Owen could have done when the rebellion ended and the Baratheons victorious. Orton Merriweather convinced King Robert I Baratheon to restore Longtable, its titles and some of their lands to him and House Merriweather. But Robert emptied the Merriweather treasuries in compensation. The family's wealth and status has not completely recovered, so Orton is not as rich and powerful as his grandfather Owen. But in time, House Merriweather would start to build up their riches again. During the main book series, Lady Tiana of Mere, the wife of Lord Orton Merriweather, is the companion of Marjorie Tyrell when she arrives in King's Landing. Orton is present at the wedding of Tyrion Lannister and Sansa Stark, but plays no real role in it. However, after Joffrey I Baratheon is poisoned at his own wedding, Tiana swears at Tyrion Lannister's treason trial that she saw him drop something into the king's wine during his wedding feast. Later, after the War of Five Kings had finally come to an end, Lady Tiana plays a significant part during the start of King Tommen I Baratheon's reign, being a confidant, advisor, and occasionally sharing the bed of Cersei Lannister, the Queen Regent. Cersei offers to foster Russell Merriweather, the young son of Tiana and Orton, in King's Landing, which Tiana says she would consider. Cersei then names Lord Orton to her small council as Justicar, a master of laws, and later raises him to be the new hand of the king after she demotes Sir Harris Swift to master of coin and lord treasurer. After Cersei's imprisonment by the faith of the seven, Tiana and Orton flee King's Landing and return to Longtable due to Tiana's close connection to Cersei. Finally, as of the end of A Dance with Dragons, this is all we currently know of House Merriweather. <laughs>